leave it with the clerk. Leave it with the clerk. Could just leave it with the clerk. Please, could you, you just need to go give these to the clerk? Get nice start meeting. Record it. Good evening. Good evening. I'm glad to have everybody here. I always wait till seven o'clock sharp to start the meeting, but so it's really great to, great to see everybody. I certainly want to welcome everybody here tonight uh, to our uh, Durham City Council meeting for the evening of March the 4th, 2019. And uh, I would like to ask you all if you would first please join me with a moment of silent meditation. Thank you. And now I will ask uh, Council Member Reese if he would uh, do the honors with the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, everyone. Uh, we have, uh, we are very rich in friends tonight, Mr. Mayor. And included in that number are 10 different uh, Girl Scout troops. I'm gonna read off the troop numbers and then they'll come up here and help us with the pledge. This is uh, Girl Scout Troop 264, 966, 998, 1141, 1425, 1640, 3414, 3579, 40, 36, and 50, 51. If you guys want to come up and help us with the pledge, that would be awesome. Everyone else, if it's your practice to do so, and if you're able, please join us and uh, rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> Look at herself on. You trying to look at yourself on television? I won't bite you. <laughs> Plenty of room. I know. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. That was awesome. Thank you so much. Great job. Thank you. Wonderful to have all these scouts, and we're going to honor them Hello. again in a minute. Yeah, they're being excited about being here. I forgot something. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? <laughs> Mayor Shule. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Here. Councilmember Alston. Here. Councilmember Caballero. Here. Councilmember Freeman. Present. Councilmember Middleton. Here. And Councilmember Reese. Here. Thank you. All those Girl Scouts just, it was so much fun. I forgot what I was supposed to be doing. So thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, we, are, we are now going to enter into a very enjoyable part of our meetings, which is our ceremonial items. We have a number of ceremonial <coughs> items tonight. And I'm going to uh, begin by asking my city council colleague, Mark Anthony Middleton,
uh, to do the honors for National Development Dis Disability Awareness Month, and to um, uh, if we'll be presenting this to Dietra Spellman. Are you, is Ms. Spellman here? Great, nice to see you. And uh, she's the Recreation Manager for Special Programs, Mature Adults, and Inclusion uh, with Durham Park and Rec. And is there anyone else you would like to have up here with you? All right, great. Mark Anthony. Thank you, sir. Good evening, Bull City, and my thanks to His Honor the Mayor for, as I always say, allowing us to participate in what's probably the coolest part of his job, and that's the reading of these proclamations. Whereas Public Law 99-483 enacted by Congress in 1987, designated the month of March as National Developmental Disabilities Awareness Month. And whereas Durham is home to over 30,000 people with developmental and other disabilities, and whereas Durham residents with disabilities are productive community members, neighbors, and family members, deserving of respect and opportunities for economic self-sufficiency, independence, and personal growth, and whereas all Durham residents with and without disabilities work together, play together, learn together, and grow together. And whereas Durham is committed to continuing to work towards a more inclusive community with greater opportunities for residents with disabilities to live full and happy lives. Now, therefore, I, Stephen M. Shule, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim March 2019 <coughs> as Developmental Disabilities Awareness Month in Durham, North Carolina, and commend its observance to all residents. Witness my hand and the corporate seal of the city of Durham, North Carolina, this the fourth day of March, 2019. <laughs> she doesn't want to say any words. Thank you so much, Ms. Spellman, and thank you so much, Councilmember Middleton. And now we're going to have you might not be surprised to hear that we're going to recognize Girl Scout Week. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to ask uh, three of our council members who were former Girl Scouts. And I'm going to ask all three of our council members who were former Girl Scouts. Woo! Yeah! And I'm going to ask Shanika Thomas, Director of Advocacy and Educational Partnerships for the Girl Scouts of the North Carolina Coastal Hans, if you would join us, thank you so much. Is there anyone else that you would like to have come up here and join you as well? Davida and Glendora. All right, please come on up. And I'm going to turn this over to our City Council Girl Scouts and uh, ask whichever one of them would like to do the honors to please do so. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Uh, being part of the Girl Scouts was really exciting um, and fun part of my childhood. And when I had my first kid, I actually sang him to sleep with Girl Scout camp songs. Uh, so it has remained with me um, as an adult. Uh, so I'll go ahead and read this proclamation. Whereas the year 2019 marks the 170th anniversary of Girl Scouts of the USA, uh, I'm sorry, 107th anniversary of Girl Scouts of the USA, the largest and most successful leadership program for girls in the world, and whereas Girl Scouts unleashes the G-I-R-L, or girl, go-getter, innovator, risk-taker, leader in every girl, preparing her for a lifetime of leadership. And whereas Girl Scouts combines time-tested, research-backed methods with exciting modern programming that speaks to today's girls and is designed to cater to the strengths of girls' leadership development. And whereas Girl Scouts offers girls 21st century programming in science, technology, engineering, and math, STEM, the outdoors, entrepreneurship, and beyond, helping girls develop invaluable life skills and take the lead early and often. And whereas, as the world's premier leadership development organization for girls, Girl Scouts welcomes girls of all backgrounds and interests who want to develop the courage, confidence, and character to make the world a better place. And whereas research shows that girls learn best in all girl, girl-led environments in which their specific needs are addressed and met, and whereas the Girl Scout Gold Award, the highest and most prestigious award in Girl Scouting, calls on Girl Scouts in grades 9 to 12 to take on projects that have a measurable and sustainable impact on a community by first assessing a need, designing a solution, completing a project, and inspiring others to sustain it. And whereas with more than 100 years of experience, Girl Scouts brings a wealth of knowledge to programs that deliver girls' cornerstone experiences with benefits that last a lifetime. 
And whereas today more than 50 million women are Girl Scout alums and 2.6 million girls and adults are current members. Now, therefore, I, Mayor Stephen M. Shul, uh, now, therefore, I, Stephen M. Shul, Mayor of the City of Durham, do hereby proclaim the week of March 11 to 15, 2019, as Girl Scout Week in Durham, and hereby urge all citizens to take special note of this observance, and to hereby applaud the Girl Scout movement and the North Carolina Coastal Pines for providing girls with a safe, inclusive, all girl space where they can hone their skills and develop leadership abilities. Thank you for honoring Girl Scouts today as it celebrates its 107th birthday and more than a century of extraordinary leadership and driving sustainable change in communities throughout the United States and beyond. As the largest leadership development organization for girls in the world, Girl Scouts helps girls develop into future leaders of our communities, our country, and our world. Across Central and Eastern North Carolina, we serve more than 27,000 girls and 9,000 adult volunteers. Right here in Durham, we serve 2,230 girls. We didn't bring all of them tonight, though. <laughs> We're uniting the best of our legacy experiences, like outdoor adventures, camping, and our cookie program, with new programs in computer science, computational thinking, and engineering to ensure that we offer a truly one-of-a-kind experience for today's girls. As we celebrate Girl Scouts' 107th birthday, we invite you all to be a part of our work throughout the year. Thank you for acknowledging the Girl Scout movement that serves our community by building girls of courage, confidence, and character who will make the world a better place. Mayor does now. <laughs> Good news for us, we got some Girl Scout cookies. Yes. <laughs> there they are. And you can see with my city council colleagues what great leadership uh, the Girl Scouts develop. And uh, that's, proof in the, that, that's proof right there. All right. Um, and now we're going to move uh, to our history moment. And this will be our salute to Judge Allison Duncan. And uh, Eddie Davis, our <coughs> public historian, is going to help me. Judge Duncan, would you and anyone who is with you who you'd like to come up and join you, uh, come on up. Perfect. Great to see you. And, uh, Eddie, come on up. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to first read this proclamation, and uh, then we're going to hear from uh, Eddie Davis, and then we're going to hear from Judge Duncan. We're so glad to have you. Whereas Judge Allison K. Duncan, a native of Durham, has announced her pending retirement from the Fourth Circuit of the United States Court of Appeals, and whereas Allison Duncan graduated from Hillside High School in 1968, Hampton University in 1972, and Duke Law School in 1975, and whereas after law school she clerked for the distinguished Judge Julia Cooper Mack of the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, and whereas Allison Duncan served as an attorney at the United States Equal Opportunity Commission from 1978 until 1986 and rose to the rank of the general counsel for that federal agency. And whereas Allison Duncan returned to her home state in 1987 and became a professor at the North Carolina Central School of Law. Her mother had served as a law librarian at NCCU and her father had served as superintendent of buildings and grounds at the university. And whereas Allison Duncan later served on the North Carolina Utilities Commission and in 1990, earned the title of judge by being the first African-American woman to serve on the North Carolina Court of Appeals. And whereas in 2003 and 4, Judge Duncan became the first African-American person to be elected to the position of president of the North Carolina Bar Association. And whereas on April 2nd, I'm sorry, April 28th, 2003, President George W. Bush nominated Allison K. Duncan to serve on the Fourth Circuit of the United States Court of Appeals. In spite of the partisan bickering that existed then and now, Judge Duncan was robustly supported by North Carolina's two U.S. Senators, one Republican and one Democrat. Judge Duncan was confirmed by the full U.S. Senate by a vote of 93 to 0 on July 17, 2003, and received her commission on August 15, 2003. 
And whereas, during Judge Duncan's tenure on the Court of Appeals, she has continued to distinguish herself by being elected to serve as the president of the Federal Judges Association and the vice president of the International Judges Association. And Chief Justice John Roberts has appointed her to serve as the chair of the International Judicial and Review Committee of the FJA. Now, therefore, I, Stephen M. Shule, mayor of the city of Durham, and on behalf of the city council, do hereby recognize Judge Allison K. Duncan for her contribution to our community and urge all citizens to join us as we extend our sincere appreciation on her work and wish her well in her retirement. Witness my hand in the corporate seal of the city of Durham, North Carolina, this, the 14th day of April, 2019. Judge Duncan, we are very, very proud of a Durham person who has gone to international heights. Uh, most of you know that the Court of Appeals is just the step lower than the United States Supreme Court. We should be very proud to have someone who has risen to that rank uh, in the legal um, system that we have in this country. Um, Judge Duncan, and there is another judge who actually serves on the Court of Appeals in the 6th District, whose name is Judge Eric Clay, who also is a graduate of Hillside High School, also is a native of Durham. And I think you all missed each other at Hillside by one year, because at that time, Hillside had three grades. So by the time that Judge Duncan got to Hillside, Judge Clay had already graduated and moved on to UNC. But we are proud of both of them. But tonight belongs to Judge Duncan. Uh, she has done outstanding work, as you have read, heard through the proclamation. She's never forgotten her Durham roots. And it's good that she continued to work through North Carolina Central in so many different ways. Both her parents were employees at the university, so in many ways she grew up there in the university, running around, lived not far from the university, and also spent lots of time in the law library where her mother was in charge. She's given outstanding work on the state level, outstanding work on the national level, and outstanding work on the international level. Uh, we were chatting before uh, the meeting started, and she has another five years, I believe, on the term um, as the vice president of the International Judges Association, or International Association of Judges. So we are very proud to have someone who is our own, who has risen to such ranks, and who will continue to do great things on the national and international level. So the best thing for me to do is to stand back and allow you to hear from Judge Allison K. Duncan. Well, first of all, I would like to say that I think Judge Clay is actually much older. <laughs> What I'm proudest of is being here tonight and seeing all of you. I grew up in Durham. My roots go deep here. I lived on Pico Street near the old Hillside High School, and my parents, as you've heard, worked at North Carolina Central. So I spent growing up years crawling around in the law school, and I'm told that at one point the gavel in the moot courtroom bore teeth marks. <laughs> I went to church at Holy Cross, the little um, African-American church near Chidley Hall. And some of my church members, my church family, are here tonight. Thank you for being here. I've been, <laughs> I've been extremely fortunate during my career to travel all around the world and see people who live in circumstances that make me feel humble and grateful for what I have. But what I am most proud of, I think, is, is my roots here in this wonderful, rich, vibrant community that I see reflected before me in the faces of the Girl Scouts, 
in the leadership that you have assembled, and all the people here tonight to participate in the democratic process. I am honored and humbled and more grateful than I can say for this honor that you have bestowed on me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Judge. It's always an honor to uh, be up here on the podium with one of our first sons or daughters, and uh, we're so grateful to be able to honor you tonight. And now I'm going to ask uh, Councilmember Vernetta Austin if she will join me, and um, she will do the honors on this next proclamation. This is the Women's History Month proclamation, and I'm going to ask Nana Asante Smith of the Mayor's Council for Women and Kim Cameron, the Vice Chair of the Mayor's Council for Women, Dr. Michelle Laws and Ruby Holmes of the Durham Women's Commission, Durham County Women's Commission. If, if you all are here, please join me. And I am uh, going to step away from the podium for a moment, and I'm going to turn this over to Councilmember Austin. Whereas women have played a unique role throughout the history of the city of Durham and Durham County, North Carolina, and the nation in many ways. And whereas women have persevered in overcoming challenges and fought for what they believed in. And whereas women have been leaders, not only in securing their own rights of suffrage and equal opportunity, but also in governance, medicine, mental health, social justice, business, and fashion and beauty, and other movements, while, which create a more fair and just society for all. And whereas too often women are unsung and sometimes their contributions go unnoticed with many history books focusing primarily on political, military, and economic leaders and events. However, the achievements, leadership, courage, strength, and love of the women who helped build America is, vital as, is as vital as the, that of the men whose names we know so well. And whereas the Equal Rights Amendment it is a proposed amendment to the United States Constitution designed to guarantee equal legal rights for all American citizens regardless of sex. It seeks to end the legal distinctions between men and women in terms of divorce, property, employment, and other matters. The ERA was originally written by Alice Paul and Crystal Eastman and introduced in Congress for the first time in 1921 and has prompted conversations about the meaning of legal equality for women and men ever since. And whereas looking over the past 150 years since Confederation, Countless women have harnessed their energy and talents, found their voice, and claimed their place in our country's proud history, and younger generations of women will carry the torch and continue to contribute to Durham County, North Carolina, and this nation. Now, therefore, I, Stephen M. Shule, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim the month of March 2019 as Women's History Month in Durham, and hereby urge all citizens to take special note of this observance as well as libraries, schools, and community organizations as we raise our awareness about the generations of women who have, who are, and who shall shape and influence the history of Durham, North Carolina, and the world. Witness my hand and the corporate seal of the city of Durham, North Carolina, this 18th day of March, 2019. <laughs> Greetings. Mayor Schull and City Council. Thank you uh, for having us for recognizing Women's History Month for both the uh, Mayor's Council on Women, right? I'm gonna say it wrong, I know. And the Durham County Women's Commission. Um, we have worked actively, more so actively over the past few years to ensure issues that affect women and children are at the forefront in Durham. Uh, pay equity, affordable housing, homelessness, food insecurity. Um, we will continue the fight for the women and children of Durham with your help, with the county commissioners and with city council. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, council member Austin, and the members of the commissions and the council. Uh, our final Ceremonial item tonight, I'm going to ask former Mayor Bill Bell, who I've asked to be here with us tonight, to join me here at the podium and to help me do this. Uh, we are 
saying a sad farewell tonight to our longtime city attorney and our former city manager, Mr. Patrick Baker. And Patrick, I want to ask you to come and join us. And if Rayanne would like to come up as well, we're so we're so uh, sad to see Patrick go, but also happy for him. Uh, as you, many of you all know, most of you all know, uh, Patrick will be going to the city of Charlotte to become their city attorney. We tried to sabotage that. It didn't work, uh, but uh, Patrick has just been an amazing, amazing servant of the city and people of Durham. I'm going to read this proclamation, uh, and I'm going to say a word or two, and then I'm going to ask uh, Mayor Bell if he would like to say a word, and then I'm going to turn it over to you, Patrick. This is a proclamation honoring Patrick Baker. Whereas Patrick Baker has offered tremendous service to the city and people of Durham for the past 21 years, seven of them as assistant city attorney, four of them as city manager, and for the past 10 years as city attorney. And whereas Patrick Baker is one of the few public servants in this country to have served with distinction as both city manager and city attorney of a major American city. And whereas Patrick Baker has played a major role in most of the major accomplishments of the city of Durham in the past 21 years, either a city manager or city attorney, including, but not limited, to the Durham Performing Arts Center, the Durham Bulls Athletic Park, the development of Eastway Village, the establishment of Keep Durham Beautiful, the steady downward trend of crime in Durham, the downtown renaissance, the recent affordable housing efforts, and much, much more. And whereas Patrick Baker has led the attorneys in the city attorney's office to be one of the finest law firms of any type in the city of Durham, doing exceptional work to represent and defend the city government and our residents in all types of cases. And whereas, a testament to Patrick Baker's leadership and collegiality is the exceptional longevity of the service of the attorneys in his office. And whereas, Patrick Baker has a strong reputation for honesty and integrity that engenders trust in everyone he works with. And whereas, Everyone who has come to know Patrick Baker knows that he is devoted to his family and he exhibits to everyone he meets kindness and decency and he is simply one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet. And whereas Patrick Baker has, in summary, given splendid service to the city and people of Durham over the past 21 years, now therefore I, Stephen M. Shule, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim March 4, 2019 as Patrick Baker Day in the City of Durham and do hereby commend its observation to all of the residents of Durham, and do, in addition, present to Patrick Baker the key to the city of Durham in gratitude for his unstinting devotion to Durham and its people. Witness my hand in the corporate seal of the city of Durham, North Carolina, this the fourth day of March, 2019. And I'm going to first uh, hand this key over to uh, City Attorney Baker. Good evening to the uh, Good evening. city manager and my former colleagues and colleagues on the city council, city attorney, and those that are in the audience. Uh, th this is really a sort of a signal evening, as far as I'm concerned, for ceremonial items. You can imagine over the years I've been through quite a few pledges to the flag, and uh, we've had the Boy Scouts here. It's the first time I know we've had the Girl Scouts since, since I've been here. Uh, and I just look at all the people who have been acknowledged this evening, Allison, the women. And uh, I, I was at an event this weekend, Saturday, at a luncheon, where the mayor pro tem uh, brought greetings on behalf of the Durham City Council and the city of Durham. And one of the things that she mentioned was that now the city council is a majority women. And I see that tonight. <laughs> I, I can't help but imagine that that played a part in what we've got. Not saying no one was deserving, but it's just good to see the type of recognitions that we see here this evening. Uh, I, I said that in preference to my very short comments about Patrick, and I appreciate the mayor inviting me to be a part of this. Uh, Steve said he tried to sabotage it. Mm -hmm. well, I'm going to tell you, I tried to sabotage it also. <laughs> uh, 
I, I got a call from uh, Patrick uh, asking if I might consider being one of his references uh, as he was being considered for the position of the city attorney in Charlotte. So I said, Patrick, uh, first of all, let, let, let me say this. Um, I, I, don't, I don't mind doing that, but uh, there, there's one condition. And if, if any of you know, it's sort of been an annual thing, at least for me, that Patrick, through Ray, brings in chocolate fudge <laughs> every Christmas, sometimes Thanksgiving. And I've sort of become addicted to it uh, if on an annual basis. So I said, it depends on, on what we say and how this thing turns out. Uh, you've got to make a commitment to me, and I'm still going to get this chocolate fudge, at least annually. And I don't know if I've got to come to go, have to go to Charlotte to get it, or you go ship it to me, but you've got to make that commitment. So, Ray, I don't know if he told you that or not. Okay, okay, we said, and not, now that we said it publicly, everybody knows about it. But seriously, I, I think the proclamation uh, says not all, but pretty much what Patrick has meant for, for this community. Uh, I've had the pleasure, obviously, of serving with him, both as a city attorney, as a manager, but most importantly, it's just as a friend. And it's no question in my mind, I told the uh, guy, who, the headhunter, who was uh, interviewing me, I said, look, if... Patrick Baker can serve as the city attorney for as long as he has in the city of Durham, knowing the city of Durham, knowing the type of council members, including me, that he's had to work with. He can be the city attorney for anybody. So, I, 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 and, I, and I, I, was, I said that in jest, but I really mean that. Uh, he, he brings a lot of uh, integrity to the office. He brings the type of leadership that is needed. And he looks out for the city first and then keeping the council straight. So I, I want to again say, Patrick, congratulations to you and Ray as you take on this next challenge uh, in, in your career. Uh, we appreciate very much what you've done and what you continue to do as the city attorney for the city of Charlotte, but more importantly, for just being a friend. And I wish you and your family the best. Before I introduce Patrick, and thank you, Mayor Bell, I do want to tell you two things. One is, I also said to Rayanne today, are we going to get still get the fudge? <laughs> Apparently, uh, you have to be a former mayor to get it. <laughs> okay, good. She says I get it. But I, since Bill is here, I want to tell you another story about Patrick. Uh, for the six years before I was mayor, when I was on city council, I sat in the seat where Vernetta sits. Patrick sat here where Kim is. And Bill sat over there in the empty seat, the mayor's seat. And uh, over a few number of years, when things got frustrating, I would say to Bill, I would pass a note over to Bill and say, I really need a pastrami sandwich. Well, Bill, as you know, likes pastrami sandwich. You may not know, likes pastrami sandwiches as much as I do. And finally, it got around to the point where we were asking Patrick, how come you never bring us one of the pastrami sandwiches when things are getting tough? Well, uh, eventually, one day, uh, Patrick sent us an email about a legal matter. And Bill wrote him back, Mayor Bell wrote him back and said, Patrick, that's fine. We appreciate your advice, but where is that pastrami sandwich? <laughs> and it arrived the next meeting. Uh, so we have been so lucky to have Patrick as our city attorney, and now I'm going to turn it over to him for anything that he would, might like to say to us in farewell. Patrick. So my mom was going to join us. Uh, she was not feeling good, but she said that she has a hard time hearing us on, on the Monday night meetings, and she asked me to speak into the microphone. So mom, can you hear me? Um, I am, I'm going to try to, try to get through this. Uh, my contract with the city says that I have uh, 60 days of notice of, of resignation of the position, uh, which I announced uh, back on, I think it was uh, January the 7th. And 60 days on January the 7th seems like such a long time. Um, but it has been the fastest 60 days uh, of my life as I've been trying to wrap up 22 years um, and turn it over uh, to the very able hands of uh, Kim Rayberg and, uh, and the team of attorneys that we have going forward. Uh, I've done, I think, the calculations, and there have been about 349 council meetings 
uh, that I've been a part of since uh, some, since moving from the attorney's the city uh, assistant city attorney position to the city manager position. Uh, we've had some doozies. We've had some. I think we've talked about uh, a one meeting that went to uh, two fifteen in the morning, uh, followed by a trip to uh, to the old honeys. Um, until the until the sun uh, rose up, uh, that was the night that we got the uh, the DPAC uh, and West Village. Uh, but I've never actually watched a council meeting just for the sake of watching it or reliving it because you you're you're up there. You you go through the process, and the last thing you really want to do is uh, is relive it again. But this last council meeting uh, that that we had uh, the February 25th or whichever the date was, the very last council meeting, uh, was the first time that I've I've actually gone back and watched it just for the sake of watching uh, and reliving a couple of the moments. Uh, there was a, a touching moment. The, uh, the Whoever came up with the idea of the history moments, I don't know if that was you, Tom, or, or whomever, um, but that's that's fabulous. I, I love that. Uh, and having Mickey Michaud uh, here uh, with his years of service and looking at at, um, you know, you, you talk about the people that go before you and pave the way for you, uh, and Mickey and his generation, uh, the, the ceiling that was placed on them by local, state, and federal governments uh, of people of color uh, and that generation that, that, that resisted that and pushed the ceiling up for people like me to do the things that I've done, I really appreciated that. And, and, and Mickey, I think, is 88 years old. If God, if God wants me here for 88 years, I need to look like Mickey. When, uh, when, when I'm 88, I, I hope that I can and speak a lot like he does. And then there was Tony Simpson. Again, I'm sure this is you, Tom, the neighborhood spotlight. Do I give that one to you as well? Tony Simpson, I don't know if you saw him. Uh, that is the happiest man, or at least tied for the happiest man in the world. Um, he loves his community, loves Durham, has big thoughts about Durham. Uh, and if I thought I could pull off the pink suit, uh, I, would, I would have done it because he, he pulled it off really well. And then there was a... Um, comments made by Bernetta Austin uh, that, that exuded absolute class and dignity, and it's refreshing to hear an elected official be able to inspire with words in a day and age where some of them don't. Um, and I really appreciated your comments. Uh, you were certainly entitled to go a different route, uh, but I get the sense that that's not who you are. Um, and I really appreciated uh, your comments. And then there was the mayor's state of the city uh, address that violated all of Howard Clements' rules of uh, uh, be seen, be brief, be seated. Um, that was a that was a doozy. But what I loved about it was it was big and it was bold. Um, uh, this was, uh, and I was thinking that Durham didn't always think big and bold. Um, when I first got here in 1997, it seemed like we were always stumbling over ourselves, and and we were little old Durham, and nothing good would happen here. Uh, and I can remember my first task as city manager. Uh, was the eight bonds for a better Durham, $110 million bond referendum. And then we moved on to uh, uh, to the, the Eastway uh, Village uh, project. And then we went to redevelop uh, uh, what is now Southside. And, and now we've built the number one theater in the world. We just got bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, I think now uh, my office is involved with the DEER program, the Durham Expunction and, and Revocation program. Uh, again, big, bold ideas that once upon a time Durham was afraid to do, or it seemed like we were afraid to do. We didn't think the good things happened in Durham, and we made it a, a tagline, and, and now things uh, actually uh, happen here. Um, I know that I don't get the opportunity to, to write um, you know, my name into the history books, because that's what Eddie Davis is here uh, to do. Um, but Eddie, if you could put me in the chapter of the, of the bold thinkers, the people that felt that Durham could be uh, great things and can do great things, um, because I trust me, I would not have been here 22 years if I didn't believe in this community and believe in the people uh, that, that serve uh, the community and the residents that live in the community. I just want to say thank you to everybody um, all the residents of Durham who have supported me, all the councils, the councils who hired me, uh, the councils who have supported me. Uh, I want to thank Tom Bonfield for his friendship and the leadership. It was just the perfect handoff in 2008 uh, to turn the, the organization over to you, and it has paid dividends, that decision, and your decision to come here. Uh, Kim Rayberg, I want to congratulate you for the opportunity that you've been given. Uh, it is an enormous opportunity, uh, but you are the absolute right person uh, for the position. And Diana Schreiber, I am so happy to have played a part in the selection process that yielded uh, your your um, uh, being brought on as the city clerk. I know you'll do great things. Uh, so I wish you all well, Godspeed, uh, and Bull City for life.
That was really fun. What a great group of ceremonial items. I have some bad news. As you all may know, Duke lost to Carolina oh, yeah. two weeks ago, and I unfortunately made a bet with the mayor of Chapel Hill as a Duke fan <laughs> that I would wear this hat during the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta take a picture. Of that. <laughs> Excuse me, Mayor Shul. Last way. This way. I will just. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that is a beautiful shade of blue, Mr. Mayor. Oh, beautiful. Oh my gosh. Oh, the brightest, the brightest I will just say that this hurts me to my core. <laughs> Bye. <clears throat> but a bet is a bet, and I'm a I'm a good loser. All right. I'm going to let the scouts get out after thank you all so much for being here. And then we'll, once the Girl Scouts have made their way out, we will have announcements by members of the council. Any other folks who are standing? Yeah. And if anyone who's standing, we have plenty of seats now. And so uh, please uh, take your seat uh, in one of the seats up here. We've got an auditorium full of seats. Come back and see us again. Yeah, it's great. Bye. Great. All right. Uh, if those who are standing could please take a seat, I would appreciate it. Thank you so much. And now we're going to go ahead and proceed with announcements by members of the council. Are there any announcements by any of my colleagues? Any announcements by members of the council? Mr. Mayor. Councilmember Middleton. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and good evening to everyone in the chamber uh, once again. Uh, Mr. Mayor, this is our first public meeting as a council. Uh, since we learned last week um, that our friends, and they are indeed friends at Duke University, um, decided not to enter into an agreement with us uh, to cede land uh, for the light rail project. Um, I, I wrote an op-ed uh, last week that appeared in local media, uh, to which I've gotten a, a firestorm of, of responses to. Um, and I wanted this very briefly tonight, Mr. Mayor, um, respond to some of the responses rather than write another op-ed to just briefly say a couple of things. Firstly, I want to give credit where credit is due. Um, I was not the first one to uh, broach the subject of eminent domain. Um, the threshold for eminent domain has already been crossed in this project some years ago. Uh, what I did was seek to uh, extend a conversation that had already been uh, started and indeed a threshold that had already been crossed um, and with that, I think there's a very, very different discussion that we should be having uh, about it. Uh, secondly, also, I, I want to respond to those who thought it was inappropriate or, or trying to start a war or, or, or disrespectful in some way. Um, Mr. Mayor, I, I grew up in the black church. Um, I was raised in a community uh, where elders gathered youth at their feet and regaled us with stories of young boys that faced giants and young girls that went to see kings unannounced. We also learned of stories of people, uh, ordinary men and women, that faced down not one wealthy institution, but a nation, an entire legal system, an entire economy uh, that said we were less than. Uh, it wasn't just one institution that I learned that we faced down, it was an entire country. So I wanna apologize 
if I have not shown the appropriate amount of deference or fear and trembling in the face of a wealthy, powerful institution. Uh, I get it from my mama. We've crossed a threshold, Mr. Mayor, and we're about to cross a threshold, and I think that my fellow citizens and residents will consider a couple of things. Um, there's a saying that I think uh, captures what it means to be a free people living in a constitutional democracy. Vox populi, vox dei. It means that the voice of the people is the voice of God in a constitutional democracy. And you might be an individual that has no money, uh, that has no influence, you may not have a bunch of connections. But in our system, something special and sacred happens that when each of us as individuals bonds together and puts our will together and puts our power and our resources together and elect a government. When all of our wills are combined, there is nothing more sacred or nothing more powerful than the expressed collective will of a people through their government. And I ask uh, all of my friends in the city listening tonight, whether you agree with the merits of light rail or not, I'm not here to debate the merits of light rail, but I am here to debate the integrity of our government and what it means to be a free people. Are you comfortable living in a context where the expressed will, the collective expressed will of a people is held to a veto power by an unelected institution, no matter how cherished or loved they are, and they are indeed cherished and loved. Are you comfortable with that? Are we comfortable as a people with a government that decides to use a tool in its toolbox on certain people based upon whether they can fight back or not or how wealthy they are? Because that's what we're up against right now. We've used the tool already. In a democracy, if you don't agree with something, here's the way we deal with it. You unelect us. And then you elect people that think like you do, who agree with your views, and then those people enact policy. If you're against light rail, you don't want it killed this way. Because next time it might be something you want. Next time it might be something you agree with. We're free people and that's the way we do business. I would respectfully submit to you that Durham is a city with a functioning government. We're not applying for entry to grad school. We are trying to secure our economic future and make good public policy. And I would submit that only us and us alone should be the ones to make public policy, whether you agree with it or not. Let us be very careful the threshold we're about to cross and let us be very sober in reflecting how we want to run our city and who indeed runs our city. And who are our friends, and they are indeed are our friends, but who's in charge of our city? Vox Populi, Vox Dei. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council Member. In, any other announcements by members of the Council? All right, thank you very much. Uh, we will now move on to our priority items. Uh, and I'll first ask, are there any priority items by the City Manager? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I do not have any priority items this evening, but as a uh, matter of personal privilege, it is uh, my great pleasure to introduce to you and welcome to the chambers my great niece, mm -hmm. Ashton Carr, who I did not know was going to be with us this evening. Ashton, where <laughs> are you? Ashton is a junior at Duke University. As you might expect, she could be because she's there, she's an extremely smart young lady <laughs> studying medicine, and she's here with a class, she tells me, ethics in an unjust world. So right. I thought that's very appropriate that she'd be here tonight, but Ashton, welcome. Welcome, Ashton. And she's terribly mortified, and she's going to call her grandmother my sister this evening, and I'll be hearing about it, I'm sure. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Manager. That was a great priority item. And uh, Madam Attorney. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. It's good to be with you as well as Mayor Pro Tem and the members of council. I'm Kim Rayberg from the Durham City Attorney's Office. I know it says Patrick Baker, but obviously I'm not Patrick. I do not have any priority items this evening. I'm just glad to be here. Thank you. And I want to mention that uh, as of uh, the day that uh, Patrick's last day, uh, Kim has been chosen as our interim city attorney, and we're very, very pleased with that. And glad to have you here, Kim. Madam Clerk, any priority items? Good evening, Mayor and Council. I have no items. Thank you so much. We'll now proceed with the consent agenda. 
the consent agenda can be approved by a single vote of the council. Any member of the council or member of the public can pull an item from the consent agenda, and it, at, if it is, an item is pulled, it will be taken up at the end of the meeting. So I will read the <coughs> consent agenda. Item one, approval of city council minutes. Item two, Raleigh-Durham Airport Authority appointment. Item three, timekeeping management performance audit dated January 2019. Item four, vegetation management ordinance. Item five, extension of Durham Sports Commission interlocal agreement. Item six, community development block grant reimbursement for administration expenditure. Item seven, reimbursement of funds of the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development Home Funds Fiscal Year 2014. Item eight, bid term contract for sodium hypochlorite. Item nine, amendment number one for on-call master service agreement, DOLRT plan review. Item 10, East Durham Water and Sewer Rehabilitation Project Phase 1 and Belt Street Regional Stormwater Improvements, Professional Engineering Services Contract for Hazen and Sawyer PC. Item 11, Eno River Outfall and Eno Lift Station Upgrade Project, Amendment Number 1 to Contract for Professional Engineering Services, McKimmon Creed LLC. Item 12, Bid Report, January 2019. Item 13, FY 2018 19, Second Quarter Financial Report. Item 14, cooperative group purchase contract for single axle dump trucks. Item 15, Hoover Road Athletic Park Project, construction manager at risk, CMAR, contract for pre-construction services with Skanska USA Building. Item 16, contract for SP 2019-02 stream vegetation management between the City of Durham and Riverworks Incorporated. Item 17, utility extension agreement with Rodriguez Glass Inc. to serve the Rodriguez Glass Project. Item 28, contract with Made in Durham to support the development of an education to work pipeline system for youth in Durham. Uh, you have heard the consent agenda and I will now accept a motion for its approval. So moved. Second. It's been moved and second that we approve the consent agenda. Hearing no discussion, Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Please close the vote. The motion passes 7-0. Thank you very much. We will now move on to our general business agenda, and our, fir our first item is item 19, the 2018 fourth quarter annual crime report, uh, and I'm going to ask uh, Chief Davis uh, if she would make a report. I will say that we have three, let's see, one, two, we have several speakers to this item. Uh, I'm going to, uh, Chief, after you speak and before the council asks questions, I think what I will do is ask the, the speakers to come up and then we'll follow with questions. Absolutely. All right, thank you so much. We're glad to see you. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Mayor, City Council members, City Manager, and City Attorney. Thank you for the, giving me the opportunity to present before you tonight um, an updated crime report with emphasis on the 2018 annual report. But before I start, I'd like to recognize my leadership team who's here tonight who have played a critical role in the achievements that we have made in the last year. Um, raise your hands, guys, when I call your name. Major Greg Pickrell, Major Delma Allen, Major Kevin Cates, Major Ed Sarvis, and Captain Melissa Bishop, and Will Glenn. Also I have with me is Deputy Chief Todd Rose and Deputy Chief Terrence Assembly. Uh, Chief Rose has been an intimate part and in, involved in the development of uniform patrol, crime reduction strategies, and effective retooling of the department's daily staffing and deployment. He is retiring in the next week. He has demonstrated amazing leadership over the years, showing true dedication to his work and community, and unwavering leadership to the men and women of the Durham Police Department. He will be sorely missed. I had to say that about him. So thank you for this. <laughs> he wasn't expecting that, of course. <laughs> so tonight's report highlights the department's six performance measures, which are part one violent crime, part one property crime. Part one index crime, clearance rates, response times to priority one calls, and staffing levels. I'll also speak a little bit about some of the department's <coughs> highlights in 2018. Show that. Here we go. Part one index crime is comprised 
of a combined total of Part 1 violent crime and Part 1 property crime. For 2018, Part 1 index crime was down by 7 percent. Compared to 2017 and 2018, there were decreases in aggravated assaults, robberies, larcenies, and burglaries. There was also significant uh, reductions in overall Part 1 violent crime by 13 percent and overall Part 1 <coughs> property crime by 6 percent. The largest reductions in Part 1 crime occurred during the first quarter of 2018 compared to the same period in 2017. I'm missing a slide. Yeah, right now, that's okay. Maybe it'll pop up. I am missing a slide. Forgive me for that. Okay, I'm just going to work through this. Somebody will be in trouble tomorrow for sure. <laughs> so, part one violent crime includes homicide, rape, robbery, aggravated assault. Part one violent crime in the city was at a four-year low in 2018. There were double-digit decreases in reported robberies and aggravated assaults. Robberies were at a four-year low and aggravated assaults were at a five-year low. Categories were, in were increases were um, reported was homicides and rapes. There were 35 homicides reported in 2018. Cases ruled as self-defense are not included in the final UCR total, which is why our statistics show 32, but technically there were 35. There were 29 individuals arrested on murder charges in connection with 2018 homicide cases. There were also six cases cleared from 2017 and two from 2016. There are currently 12 open cases from 2018. 14% of all rapes reported in 2018 were belated from prior years. Commercial robberies were down 48% in 2018 compared to 2017 and robberies from persons were down by 3%. <clears throat> Investigators assigned to the robbery unit arrested 70 people on robbery charges during, during 2018. Many of those individuals were involved in multiple cases. The robbery unit also only investigates the most egregious cases which involve guns. District investigators made additional robbery arrests where guns were not involved. Officers made numerous robbery arrests in the fourth quarter of 2018, which are highlighted in the accompanying report. Firearms were involved in 59% of the aggravated assault incidents in 2018, compared to 68% in 2017. Report at part Chief, one. Chief, excuse me one second. Yes, sir. I don't know that we ought to run the slides on your report because what we've got is the third quarter, uh, quarter the third quarter um, slideshow. Is that what that is? Yeah, that's why the that's why we're having the disconnect. But I think why don't you go ahead give your report orally? We've we've all got your report, uh, you know, that we've read prior to the meeting on the uh, on our agenda. Okay, uh, so well I'll the just the public I'll... won't be able to see the slides, but I think it'd be better than seeing the slides that aren't right. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. So, reported part one property crime, which includes burglary, larceny, and motor vehicle theft, was down by 6% in 2018 compared to 2017. There were decreases in burglaries and larcenies. Burglaries were at a 20-year low. Reported property crime in Durham made up 83% of all part one crime in 2018. So, in essence, while crimes against persons typically make uh, the six o'clock news, a large majority of criminal activity in the city is crimes involving property thefts, uh, vehicle larcenies, breaking and entering burglaries, et cetera. 
As mentioned, burglaries were at a 20-year low in 2018. The number of reported larcenies was the second lowest in 20 years. There was a significant decrease, actually 17% in shoplifting in 2018. Larcenies for motor vehicles comprised 46% of larcenies in 2018. So despite the many proactive measures uh, we've taken to educate our residents, cars are still left unlocked, unattended, with valuables left in plain sight. So it still presents a problem for us. Keys were left in the vehicle in 37% of cases. The majority of motor vehicle thefts happen at homes or apartments. Uh, motor vehicle thefts were at a 10-year high in 2018. We saw that uptick as it was occurring. The most stolen vehicle, again, you all know, the Honda Accord. In some instances, we've identified individuals who have committed more than one property crime, specifically burglaries and vehicle break-ins. So I've added some additional information also about uh, guns, because gun reduction, um, especially crimes that are committed with guns, are a major concern uh, in the city of Durham. Um, stolen guns in Durham, we had several cases in 2018 in which guns and accessories such as bullets, magazines, et cetera, were stolen during burglaries and break-ins to vehicles. There were 202 guns and accessories stolen during vehicle break-ins. Many of these vehicle break-ins occurred at residences, parked vehicles, and driveways, et cetera. We also had more than 90 guns and accessories stolen during burglaries at homes and businesses. The Durham Police Department recovered over 800 guns in the city of Durham in 2018. Some of this work was in, conduct in conjunction with some of our federal task forces like the ATF. As an added measure to combat gun violence in the city, the Community Services Division will be providing instruction on gun awareness and safety during our upcoming Citizens Academy and for other community and civic groups. Now I'll talk a little bit about um, part one clearance rates. Uh, the benchmark FBI clearance rates uh, that were noted um, on the slides um, are um, for populations between 250,000 and 500,000. The 2017 FBI statistics are the most recent available for comparison purposes. The Durham Police Department's clearance rates were higher than the FBI national averages in all categories, with the exception of aggravated assaults. However, our clearances in this category did exceed the clearance rate in 2017. Our part one violent crime clearance rate increased by 31.6% in 2017 to 38.3% in 2018. Moving to priority one calls for service, the number of priority one uh, calls, which are our most urgent calls, calls uh, for service declined by 4.5%. Our average response time was 6.1 minutes, which was below the target of 5.8 minutes, but an improvement over the 6.2 minutes in 2017. We answered 52.4% of priority one calls in less than five minutes, in 2018, our goal is 57%, but this is a slight improvement over the 52.1% in 2017. Our longest average response times are from districts three and four. We recently made adjustments to our beat structure based on the IACP study recommendations. So we anticipate that this realignment will help reduce response times in, com in combination with reallocating patrol resources in areas where there is the greatest demand. The ultimate goal is to confine patrol officers to their assigned district and to, um, and to have one officer per beat. Uh, not only will this improve our response times, it provides opportunities for officers to get to know the people in which um, the areas that they serve is. So staffing at the end of the fourth quarter, give you a little bit of staffing information and annual um, staffing numbers. Our sworn staffing was at 95% at the end of 2018. Currently, we're at 99% of our sworn positions being filled. 
This number includes 33 recruits who started BLET class number 49 last week on February 25th. 23 recruits from BLET number 48 graduated on February 7th. Thanks to those of you who were in attendance at that graduation. Hispanic officers made up almost one third of BLET number 48. Half of the Hispanic officers hired were military veterans and six of the eight were North Carolina residents. According to our recruiting officers, most of these recruits applied here after searching online or because they knew someone in the Durham Police Department. So we're having some good referrals. Our recruiting unit participated in more than 85 job fairs and recruiting events throughout the country in 2018. We're still taking lateral transfers from North Carolina officers as well. Uh, DPD hired 68 sworn officers in 2018. 52 officers separated from employment in 2018. Out of the 52, 24 of those were recruits in some form of training. 10 officers retired, 14 other, for other reasons, in essence, someone wanted to return to college, spouse's job, transfer them, someone decided, a few people decided to go to other agencies, someone went in the Marine Corps, and four were terminated. The average sworn attrition rate 2018 was about 4.3 officers per month, which is an improvement uh, from a couple of years ago. It's almost six officers a month. Our non-sworn staffing level was at 91% at the end of 2017. It is currently at 96%, which is the highest it's been in several years. That's our non-sworn. So I'm going to move on to our U visa requests. Uh, the Durham Police Department updated its U visa policy for certifications in 2018. Historically, most cases were denied due to a lack of workable leads. The new policy allows for qualifying cases dating from now, January 1, 2011, to present to be certified even if the case is inactive. An increase in requests for U visa certifications were received in 2018. And the graph, which I, I know you have in front of you, depicts an increase in the fourth quarter of approvals. The Durham Police Department received 119 U-Visa requests in 2017 and 222 in 2018, which is an increase of 87%. In 2017, 22% of U-Visa requests were approved. 65% of U-Visa requests were approved in 2018. I'm gonna talk a little bit now about use of force investigations. During 2018, we had a reduction of use of force complaints generated both by the department and by citizens. This is not the number of cases per se, it's the number of allegations, meaning uh, there can be multiple officers uh, in one case. The number of DPD generated complaints dropped by 19% from 59 in 2017 to 48 in 2018. The number of citizen-generated complaints dropped by 67% from 15 in 2017 to 5 in 2018. I'm also going to provide a little bit of information about a body-worn camera program, which I think is important to note that we, how we monitor it. Administrative investigations that were generated uh, from a request by me, the chief, uh, two allegations, both of those were sustained. Performance reviews usually generated and handled at the field level. There were four allegations investigated, and all of those were sustained. Citizen complaints, there were three allegations. Two were sustained, and one was exonerated. Complaints in the category of respecting the rights of others. There were no DPD-generated administrative investigations or performance reviews for this particular violation. However, we received five citizen complaints in 2018 for respecting the rights of others. One was exonerated, one was not sustained, and three were sustained. A few highlights for the year. As you know, uh, we moved into our new police and 911 headquarters building. The new facility at 602 East Main Street officially opened for business on November 1st, 2018. Everyone, including the 911 Emergency Operations Center, was moved in by December. 
On October 20th, we held a grand opening event, which was heavily attended by several hundred people. The new four-story building houses the headquarters staff from the old building substation 5 and Durham 911. Another initiative that was quite significant was the Durham Police Department of officially launching our Safe Place initiative in October 2018. The launch campaign took place at Starbucks on Guest Road. Participating businesses agree that they will provide a safe place for any LGBTQ community member or any other victim who has been harassed or victimized by hate crime, hate crimes, or any other type of victimization. The victims will be permitted to wait at that safe place business until authorities arrive to assist them and provide referrals, emergency assistance, et cetera. More than 22 businesses now have signed up and pledged to assist members of the community who find themselves victim of crime or in some other type of crisis. The Durham Police Department Safe Place is a demonstration of the department's commitment to take a proactive stance in crime prevention efforts and community engagement programming. Lastly, um, in the fourth quarter of the year, uh, during the holidays, the department participated in numerous um, programs and projects in the community. Um, just a few examples was uh, adopted families for Christmas, bought gifts for children at Shop with with the FOP, shop with a cop, delivered meals on wheels, provided gifts for the Ronald McDonald House, purchased needed items for our soft room, which is um, where we interview children that are victims of crime, <clears throat> and even provided hundreds of dollars in donations for Animal Protection Society, conducted community canvases in the Hispanic community and crime prevention forums in an effort to cur curtail robberies. Officers also conducted plan safety initiatives by being visible in shopping areas and handing out crime prevention and safety information to shoppers throughout the holiday season. And if I have skipped anything in your hard copies, I'll be glad to respond to it. Thank you. Forgive me for... All right. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. And uh, just for members of the public, uh, this is available. If you want to see the slides, they are available on our... Um, on the city website uh, for the meeting, if you're interested in uh, the in, in seeing the uh, hard copy of what the chief has re uh, reported to us. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Uh, chief, I'm going to now uh, ask uh, members of the public who would like to speak uh, to be able to do so, and then I will ask you to uh, return to the podium, and we will um, ask, ask questions and so forth. Thank you. All righty. Uh, I'm going to ask the following people. Uh, if they would please uh, come over here to my right, and uh, each of you will have three minutes, and uh, please speak in the order in which I call your name, and uh, please give your name and address when you speak. Uh, first, Mr. Chris Tiffany. Uh, second, Sherilyn Puleal Santos. Victoria Peterson. Miguel Staten, Imam Akbar, and Margarita Serrano. Mr. Tiffany, welcome. Uh, you have three minutes, sir. Right here at this podium, there was a criminal complaint that someone pulled a gun on their eight-year-old child, but that complaint was undocumented because the complaint taken first to the police department was against a cop. And right through those doors, I tried to tell the chief about that, but she cut me off, and I complained that she keeps on doing that and turning her back and walking away, and she said, I wouldn't do that. But then, when I tried to tell her about a Latino kid who, right after the gun complaint, said his complaint was worse, he was beaten, stripped naked, and body cavity searched on a, uh, uh, at an unposted target area where he went to see his high school girlfriend. But after he went to the desk with his mother and filled out a complaint form, the rape complaint was disappeared. I've tried many times to stop public strip searching, but Chief Davis, surrounded by her command staff, said, I don't want to hear about it. She turned her back and walked away again. And at a grocery store, when I told her about a couple of cops, told me they heard I was asking her out about cops stealing and selling drugs. They said, yeah, there's cops selling drugs, but it ain't none of your business. Keep your nose out of it. We know where you live. Just shoot you down like a dog in the street. No one will know. Just another drive-by. She said, I don't have time for this, and turned her back and walked away. And when I went to the desk with a criminal complaint about a city employee from PAC-4 
who chased me away from the Weaver Street polling place, swinging a baseball bat at my head. The desk officer said, take your complaint to the CIA. <laughs> and when I went to the desk with a complaint that a cop told a drug dealer there's a secret grand jury indictment against you, going to be a raid on your apartment tomorrow, the desk officer said, yeah, we know. We got leaks. And he turned his back and walked away, like Chief Davis, who does not know what goes on in her own department because, as she told me and her command staff, I don't want to hear about it. What's missing from PR, police reports, criminal misconduct, including armed robbery, drug trafficking, death threats, sexual misconduct, assault, and cops sticking criminals on complainants. Chief Davis knows what I'm talking about. Her parting shot was, we'll take a look at it. When I reminded her of a policy complaint regarding cops violating the confidentiality of confidential informants, General Order 1036, a complaint she, they, and y'all got from me in writing in 2016. Y'all need to protect confidential informants, not point them out and broadcast the identities of confidential informants to people who might, quote, shoot them down like a dog in the street, unquote, or make them disappear like criminal complaints are made to disappear. And like the crime report, slides were with details disappeared, not to be seen by the public, merely replaced by a pretty face. Thank you, Mr. Tiffany. We'll now hear from Sherilyn Puliao Santos. Ms. Puliao Santos, you have three minutes. Please give us your name and address. Thank you. Sherilyn Pulido Santos, I am a victim of the crime that occurred at the Valley Terrace apartment complex. I would like to know why it has been three months since the crime occurred and we have yet to hear from the police. With this being said, for our community as Latinos, it gives us the thought that our cases are aren't cared about, so it wouldn't matter if you contact the police or not, because either way, our case, cases aren't recognized. Ms. Puliao Santos, would you return to the podium for a moment? Let me ask you a question. Thank you. Could you tell us again where you live that you said you, you're a victim of crimes where? At the Valley Terrace Department Valley complex. Valley Terrace. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm, the chief is here, and other officers are here, and I'm sure that they've heard you, and... Uh, that will check in with you, all right? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Chief Assembly, maybe y'all could come on back. Thank you. Uh, third, we will have Victoria Peterson. Ms. Peterson, welcome. Please give us your name and address, and you have three minutes. I do not believe that citizens should have to give their address because Persons may not have anyone there at their home, and I thought we had stopped that under Mayor Bell. But I am a citizen of Durham, and my husband does pay taxes. Um, I want to just share this here. Um, first, I want to thank the chief. Thank you. A lot of persons here may disagree with me in thanking her. I just want to remind this community, before this chief came to Durham, Durham was reek in crime, and it still is. Murder is running rampant in this community. And I can speak for myself here. I voted for persons to put new people on this council. Some of y'all are gonna get mad at me on what I'm getting ready to say, but the truth is the light. Crime is still running rampant in the black community. And we have all of these African-Americans sitting on this city council. And one Hispanic, I believe. Or maybe two Hispanic. It doesn't really matter. You all live in Durham. And you have not done, you have done very little to take a real true bite out of crime. And I'm going to tell you why. I added up what the police department just gave you folks. They didn't give you the part two crime. You had close to 7,000 part two crimes in this city. You had over 400 juveniles in trouble, in trouble with the law in this city. You had close to 10,000 part one crimes in this city. That gives close to a total of over 6,000 crimes were committed in this community over 6,000, and the murder and the shooting is running rampant. I do not understand why this council did not approve for more manpower, and maybe you did, and maybe I missed it. So I'm gonna suggest it. I wanna see 10 new officers over in my district, 
over on Austin and Ridgeway Avenue. I'm tired of the shooting and the killing that's been going on in that community. I live in that community. I want to see some officers. I want those kids to start walking the beat. Thank you, sir. I also want 10 additional officers to work the whole city. And we've got to tap into the sheriff. They have officers. And I don't know where the FBI is and the SBI. Us citizens, we pay state tax and we pay Thank you, federal tax. Thank you, Ms. Peterson. Thank you. And I would like to know where those folks are to, to fight crime in this community. Thank you, Ms. Peterson. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Miguel Staten. Mr. Staten. And please mention about, I'd like to see if we can get these 20 new officers, because we need them. Ms. Peter, Ms. Peterson, Mayor. Ms. Peterson, you've had your three minutes. Thank you okay. so much. But I, I want Ms. Peterson, to thank you so much. officers that I'm asking for tonight, please, if we can get them. Please. Mr. Staten, you have three minutes, sir. Please state your name. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Mayor Tim Pro, uh, Old Durham community. Um, I listened to the chief give a statistic tonight. Um, one thing I didn't hear from him was um, about unsolved murders <coughs> here in Durham. Um, as some of you up here know, I'm the uncle of DeAndre Ballard, and his killing has gone unanswered to this day, five months after he's been murdered. Uh, Mr. Mayor, you said we were waiting for a test from the SBI lab to come back, toxicology report. Medical examiner's office that I talked to last week, they informed me they already did a toxicology report. Um, you know, with that being said, things are getting, well, seems a little sketchy because I'm getting information from the medical examiner's office about this crime, and I'm getting different information from my, my, my politicians here in Durham. Um, <laughs> Chief of Police, um, she had a meeting with the Human Relations Committee about, a, about this crime that took place here in Durham. Um, she informed them that uh, the case has been closed and turned over to the district attorney. Um, last Friday, I had a meeting with the district attorney and some two, couple of the Human Relations Committee attended that meeting with me. They informed us that that fact is not a true fact, that this case has not been turned over to her at all. Um, I'm needing to know why would the chief of police give that information with it not being a true fact. Um, also, uh, we'd like to know why has the shooter's name in this case been withheld so long from my family and the public in general. Um, constantly, this, this guy, we're talking about crime rates here in Durham. We got a man out there carrying a gun that has already killed my nephew, DeAndre Ballard. And the police department hasn't arrested him, arrested him. He's back on the streets with a loaded gun, probably the same one that he used to kill my nephew. Uh, and let's see. Well, basically, those, those are it. Those are the questions that I need answered. You know, we need to know who the killer was, why the chief of police saying the case is closed when it's not. Um, and another thing with these statistics, why isn't the chief of chief police being transparent with me and my family about this case? September 17th, DeAndre was shot and killed. Of course, you all know it took three days for them to con contact my family. She's saying she spoke to my sister, Anisha Ballard, I know for a fact she has it. I would like to have an answer for that, why she would say that. Um, with that said, you know, yeah, if somebody could give me some answers, I would greatly appreciate it. The mayor's office, governor's office, they looked at this case in the same manner I did. They dropped their mouth in awe when I told them the shooter's name hasn't been released. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Staten, thank you very much. Mr. Staten, um, I appreciate, uh, first of all, I want to say, any time a member of your family or any family is killed is a terrible, terrible tragedy. And I want to express, as I have before, to you that everybody in Durham is hurt when that happens. And I want to just express my sympathy to you and your family, for starters. Um, I, you've said several things about 
the toxicology report and that kind of thing. I'm going to suggest that you, uh, why don't you, uh, Thursday or Friday of this week, why don't you send me an email and uh, we'll get in touch again. I will, between now and then, check on if I, if I found out anything new about that. I will talk to Chief Davis. I will talk to the, uh, to the uh, district attorney and uh, we'll get back to you. Yes, sir. Right, I say I'll get back to you. I don't want to bother you. You bother me, okay? You get back to me, and I believe you have my number as well. Yes, sir. And you can call me, and we can be in touch, and I will, when I find, whatever I know at that time, I will tell you. Okay. And I will talk to the chief and the district attorney between now and then, okay? Thank you, Mr. Thank State you. And again, I, I want to say, I want to offer you uh, my condolences. Right. Council Member Freeman? I just wanted to ask a question regarding um, privacy in this matter, how much information is publicly available versus privately held um, based on the family members. I, I know he mentioned his family being involved, and I just want to make sure we're all clear on exactly what privacy looks like for this. Chief Davis, you want to comment on that? Thank you. Absolutely. And um, I would like to say that not only have we been in contact with DeAndre's mother, we have also been in contact with her in written communication to ensure that she knew that the Durham Police Department was here to support her and to execute whatever her wishes were, whether it was in a personal meeting. And I personally wrote that letter to uh, DeAndre's mother. Um, and we have spoken to Mr. Staten as well in reference to how much information we could provide. We have sent and has been since December, and I'm saying it on public record, the entire investigation to the DA's office. What has happened in the DA's office is a matter of what we need to clear up uh, between the um, exiting DA and the incoming DA. Uh, that information has been provided. The investigator who is working on that case is still there. So I don't see any reason why that cannot be cleared up. And I can assure you, as a professional, uh, we have had the utmost concern about information and providing information to the public and um, even uh, news outlets, just trying to be sensitive to um, DeAndre's mother as well, who we have communicated with on a, on a regular basis. Thank you, Chief. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Council Member. All right. Thank you so much. And Mr. Staten, you can be in touch with me, and uh, and I'll uh, I'll check into those things, and you feel free to be in touch. Okay. All righty. I'm going to now uh, call on Imam Akbar. Um, Imam, would you, would you please uh, come to the podium, tell us your name and address, and uh, you have three minutes, sir. Yes, is, my name is Imam Akbar. I'm at 1604 Adjura Street in Durham. My father-in-law and my grandparents are from Bull City right here in Durham, and I've been a clergy here uh, for 43 years. I'm an Imam, and I'm the National Chief of Staff of the New Black Panther Party for Self-Defense and called here for some forms of uh, what we may relate as some form of criminal neglect when it has come to some of the African uh, descendants here in the city of Durham. We appeal to you, uh, Mayor uh, Chua, and to uh, the city uh, manager, Tom Bonfield, and to wish that uh, Judge Duncan would team up to clear up some of the matters that have not been neglected not only the ballot case, but many other cases that may lead to some form that the city um, attorney is looking at this as some form of malfeasance in the form of when you abandon or neglect the needs of the people or what you would call, Mayor, the volition of the people or what we the people meeting the needs. If they're not met, then it takes the, the citizens to call a network or organization like us to come in and take another look and team up with the city to resolve things uh, such as suggestive uh, hangings or lynchings, modern lynchings, et cetera, and especially out on Hollywood, or Holly, um, Holloway. on Holloway, which there was a young man that was hung at the bus stop 
but it goes on from others uh, when Miss uh, uh, was at the university, and that's Miss Reed, Ms. Shanice Reed, that's a hanging in the state of North Carolina. Along with that, uh, young Tom um, Sanchez Austin, and um, there's yet another one, uh, a young brother by the name of Lennon uh, Lacey was at a, at a trailer park here. So we see that there are signs of things needed addressed as a form of criminal neglect. We can address the chief directly on some of that and the officers to combine their forces to give better services in the black community. We uh, see the neglect and we identify it. We ask the mayor and the city council to enforce uh, that, to give, to give encouragement to the police to support uh, what is right. When in an investigation, and you say there's no report or we don't have a report number, or we have uh, not uh, gotten uh, back to autopsy or something, and it leads it on into a situation like Mr. Ballard here, or Miguel and the Ballard family. So we extend the greetings to them and ask you all citizens of Durham to pull together to support the grassroots level in resolving and keeping peace in the, in the community and stopping the violence <clears throat> on both ends from the police and citizens. And it's a team effort. There may be 10 items of ne neglect we have to team up to resolve them all. Thank you, City Council. Thank you, Mayor. Mr. Mr. Akbar, uh, uh, Imam. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you yes, for uh, being here today. And yes, can you just, the, the, uh, are these folks here with you, uh, members of your the concerned so we, we, citizens? We're the concerned of citizens okay. of Durham. All right. So well, let me just say, citizens. if I'm, I'm sure that I speak on behalf of the chief, I know I speak on behalf of the council in saying that. Um, if you, if there are specific cases in which you have particular knowledge or concerns, if you would make that known to the police, yes, that would be very helpful. And I, city and or, or no, and Mr. Bonfield the, says, or the, or the city manager, Iman. The ballot case has put it on record of uh, Gary G A I R Y, and his middle name is Donovan Kimberg. That uh, there's unconfirmed, unconfirmed reports of, of what actually happened. We, the citizens, we want to know what actually happened to our citizens. Mr. Mr. Imam. I think it would be helpful if um, you, after this meeting, at yes, another time, get in touch so that she's able to get back in touch with you. And the city manager has also offered, if you have any information about any particular cases that can be investigated, that you think something has not been investigated. That's very important to all of us. So please Team don't Alliance, We have citizens here, and Mr. Dennis Garrett was doing a wonderful job in the community of bringing uh, some peace. We're talking about peace and respect in the community, and I think he goes a long way to Great. bring Thank that about. Y'all should give him Thank you, a round of applause for being here. Appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Gaddy. All right, I'm going to ask uh, for the next speaker. Thank you very much. I did so. Who are you talking about? I'm sitting here right here clapping for you, Mr. Garrett. What are you talking about? I appreciate all of the citizens. Mr. Thank you. Thank you, Imam. Res ipsa liquida. I'm going to uh, ask now for Ms. Margarita Serrano. Margarita Serrano. Is she here? Was okay. She stuck around? She's coming. She's coming. Oh, she here. She comes. Great. Hola, buenas noches a todos. Este, yo vengo para lo mismo con la jefa de policía que yo sé que no me van a entender, ¿verdad? Porque estoy hablando en español, pero no tengo otra forma. Lo que le quiero pedir a la jefa es que, por favor, si puede quitar las restricciones de la visa U, que yo sé que ya dio tres años más, que son siete, ¿verdad? Pero le doy las gracias por eso, que extendió más la de la visa U por siete años. Pero da la casualidad de que yo no califico para lo de la visa U porque mi... Mi situación fue en el 2009 y yo no aplico porque ella nada más dio del 2011 para adelante. Yo quería ver si podía ella quitar las restricciones para que podamos entrar otras personas, que somos bastante personas que hemos sido afectadas del 2010 para atrás. Yo lo único que quiero pedirle y gracias por los tres años que dio, que yo sé que no muchos no me entienden porque bueno casi todos porque estoy hablando en español y pues es todo lo que les quiero decir gracias 
Thank you. Yeah, so I think maybe, yeah. what'd you say? Is that what she said? Are you planning to translate? No, I just wanted, okay. to, wanted to go ahead and All right, up. so uh, do we have anyone here uh, tonight who can translate? Pablo, do you want to? You want no? To? I can say what she just said. No, let's let Pablo. So I want to remind the city council that as a recipient of federal funds, you must be providing language access services. I know council member Caballero has asked this body to do that. I am not employed by the city to do this. It's the city's responsibility to provide this language access service. And for the very reason that you have a constituent here who speaks Spanish and is unable to properly communicate with this council. So yes, I can do it. But I'm not going to do it because it's this council's responsibility to do it. Thank you. Okay, Pablo. Um, let me just say that we, um, if if we're informed ahead of time, that's helpful. And we do have a language access plan that we're working on and planning to adopt uh, for these very reasons. But it's very helpful to hear ahead of time. You were here. You knew the speaker was going to be here, and you could have said something. We could have had someone here to translate. Uh, Councilmember Caballero, would you like to uh, translate? Yes. So um, Margarita Serrano has just um, was here just to, saying thank you to the chief for extending the U visa policy back an th extra three years to 2011. Unfortunately, she's a victim of crime from 2009. And so even though the extension has helped many, it is not helping her and many others. And so while she's appreciative of uh, the update on policy, she would like it to go back further. All right, thank you very much, council member. Thank you, Ms. Serrano. I would also like to highlight, if I could. Of course. That it, it is important to make sure that we do have this access available, and it is important for us to be in community together around this. And if you, if you are gonna be here to speak, it would be nice, it really would be, because we actually do have services available. So just making sure that that I, re that I echo um, okay. Mayor Shul's right. comment. It's, it's of, which you were, of which you are aware. Yeah, but it's important to make sure that we have the dialogue and we know what she's saying. All right, thank you very much, Council Member. Um, and I believe that's all the speakers on this item. And uh, Chief, Chief uh, would you, you're, you're back on and... Uh, Ms. Peterson. Ms. Peterson, you know the Ms. Peterson. You've been here many times. You know the rules of this chamber. If you would like to talk to someone afterwards about that, feel free. I'll be happy to talk to you. But no one's going to respond to your question at this time. It was we 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 appreciate we appreciate your idea. Thank you, and I'll be happy to talk to you later, Ms. Peterson. But yelling out from the seats doesn't doesn't get it. Ms. Peterson, here's my response. We will respond to the chief's budget requests about officers, as we always do. Thank you. Chief, um, I expect that members of the council have questions and comments about your report. Um, and so I'll now ask any council members who have any questions or comments uh, if they would like to. Uh, council Member Cabrieto. I have a few uh, comments. First off, I want to thank the police department for their um, expanded efforts to, uh, with outreach uh, into the Latino community. We had a, a small gathering, kind of like a pilot gathering at um, Ministerio, I think if I can remember this name, uh, Guerrero Jesus Cristo, which is on uh, Roxborough Road. Mm -hmm. And we we're hopefully having another gathering at the end of the month. Uh, we had an excellent turnout. We had um, robust uh, engagement and a presence from our police, so very appreciative. You know where I stand on the U visa policy. Uh, I see huge improvements. Again, appreciative, but I will ask the same as our residents that um, I would like an unlimited amount. Thank you. Other council members, questions, comments? Council member Freeman. I just wanna come back to the privacy issue I really am concerned that uh, as a council and then also as a public, we're not really on the same page and understanding like how 
information about a case can be shared. And so I just I really want to reiterate that it's important that, that we're clear that the information that can be shared will be shared, but the information that cannot will not. Because it's not it's not just a blanket like there are investigations and we can share everything. Yeah. There are um, family members involved, especially in the case that was on Holloway Street. I think it's it's hard to imagine that if I had a family member that was um, in that position that I would have to face the public on this in this way because they want to, anyway, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Um, and I think this is a good learning opportunity for everybody too. Um, for us, and not just in this particular situation, in all of our cases, the immediate family is of the utmost importance to us. That's why we have victim witness. That's why we have all kinds of support networks when there are individuals that are victims of crime. So we extend ourselves to the immediate family, those that have the right to know and depend on the immediate family to communicate clearly with other individuals in that family that they want to uh, have privilege to that information. No, we don't provide intimate details about an investigation, a person's medical history, an individual's um, circumstances in their life in order to protect their, their public image and so on. So not just in this case, but in any case, we provide information to an immediate family member that has the need and the right to know, and we have worked very closely with both of those families. <clears throat> those individuals are not here tonight. Those individuals don't wanna be here tonight. We have been in constant communication with them. And as I mentioned earlier, anytime there's some ambiguity about whether or not I, as a chief, am doing the right thing as it relates to a family, I prefer to just put my access in writing as well. We've met with the family members. We actually took the family member of DeAndre Ballard to the DA's office to be with her to have that discussion. I followed up, especially as other family members wanted information about this investigation. We're not just protecting the family, but we're also protecting witnesses as well. Individuals who might be intimidated by someone who, who could approach them or in, intimidate them from coming forth and telling about what they saw, because our job is to get to the truth, and that's it. So I want to make this, I guess, a public announcement that, yes, we are very sensitive to the loss of a family member or community member, and we trust that individuals that are related are being provided the information that 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 mother or father wants them to know, they're providing them that information. Because what we don't want to do is provide information to people that, quite frankly, we haven't been told, yes, give that information to other family members. A cousin, an uncle, mm -hmm. we hope that they are close enough to that family that they can have the conversation. And um, as I said before, that's why I was very clear about making sure that I extended myself to uh, uh, DeAndre Ballard's mother in writing, certified letter in writing, that I am available and that if there's anything else that we can do in the Durham Police Department, please let me know. That was back in November, December. And as I, I'm hoping now that closure is being brought, you know, uh, I don't, I, I don't know at this point what else we should be saying in the public setting about this particular case. Case um, also, just for clarification, um, the case was discussed with the previous DA and investigative staff. And I personally set up a meeting with the new DA so that there could be another briefing in the event that someone needed to help articulate the investigative findings if that didn't happen over at the DA's office. So as a police department, we wanna make sure everybody has all the information that they need to make the appropriate decisions. So I hope that helps clarify things, not just for this case, but in the future. No, we do not publicize personal information 
about victims, their families, unless we are directed to by that family member. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Other questions and comments by members of the council? Council Member Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, Chief Davis. Mm -hmm. Appreciate you being with us tonight. Thank you. Um, I wanted to, first of all, thank you for all the work you've done over 2018. Uh, I think the report you delivered tonight um, is easily the best report uh, we've had um, from a police chief here in Durham about crime uh, in the city. I think the very, one of the first slides in the, um, in the full report is the uh, property and violent crime rates per 100,000 uh, people in the city. And it shows that, that last year was the continuation of an early 20 year trend in the city of Durham. There's certainly been some ups and downs, but uh, this last year was um, pretty significant in terms of the level of crime reduction. Um, the other thing I wanted to note is that the, the PowerPoint presentation also included um, some information about uh, priority calls for service um, that were also down. And I think this is, um, right, priority calls for service for 2018 were down about 4.5% from 2017. Mm -hmm. um, this is something I would like to, to mention to folks when they express some skepticism about crime and reporting and statistics is that if, if, if the numbers were going to get cooked, they'd get cooked all the way around. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the, um, the calls for service show a decline the same way that uh, the crime rate does. And so I, I appreciate that work. I also appreciate the fact that the average response time uh, has gone down this year. I know that in different parts of the city, particularly in Districts 3 and 4, they have uh, little geographic challenges uh, in terms of the size of the districts and the populations of those districts. And so appreciate the hard work your officers are doing uh, in that regard. The other thing I wanted to mention, oh, I also wanted to associate myself with um, Councilmember Caliero's a call for a broadened U visa program. I know you agreed uh, to broaden the look back. I would encourage you to continue to push uh, and again, ask us for additional resources if that's what it takes to, to process more of those applications. Um, that would be great. The other thing I wanted to mention is that, as you know, this is the report for 2018 through the fourth quarter of 2018. Um, and in the first part of 2019, we had a horrible double homicide here in the city um, that involved a double murder. Uh, and so I think all of us have been looking at and thinking about what more we can do as a city uh, to reduce uh, domestic violence crimes uh, in Durham. Uh, I know that the department has done a good job partnering with the Durham Crisis Re Response Center recently um, and trying to figure out new ways to assess the situation that, that officers find themselves in and that the victims of domestic violence find themselves in, themselves in especially when they interact with a police officer. Uh, just to, since we've been thinking about that as, as individuals and talking about it, I just wanted to point out that um, domestic part one domestic violence crimes were down considerably in 2018. I didn't do the math on it, but it looks like something around 25% um, or thereabouts um, in reduction in terms of the actual crimes that are associated with domestic violence. And so I think that's a testament to the priority that you've personally placed on it, as you and I have talked about this a number of times in these settings. And I just, I'm, I'm deeply grateful for that and for all the work that you're doing in that area. Um, and uh, just look forward to hearing more progress. Thank you, Chief Davis. Thank you. I think it would help too. Um, and I know we've talked about um, various PR campaigns, some things that are really effective at 12 o'clock at night when you're sitting and you're looking at TV and you see a, a, a commercial about if you're alone, report it to this number or that number. I think the city of, of Durham could probably get some benefit out of having, uh, I guess, some more PR efforts as it relates to where people can call sometimes. I think it might make a difference. We're trying to do some proactive things as well, even with the Safe Place campaign, not just for LGBTQ um, community members, but also putting it out that any type of human trafficking, uh, domestic violence, uh, to identify more locations that we can put those stickers on so people know that you know what, I can come here and somebody can help me. That's fantastic. So, thank you. Thank you, Chief Davis. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councilmember Austin. Uh, thank you. Um, Chief, I want to acknowledge the positive numbers and, and also appreciate the 
Uh, a lot of the life-saving work by some of your officers that's always outlined in your reports and just thank them for that. Uh, one question, uh, not as it relates to any specific case, but just generally, I was hoping you could explain uh, in layman's terms what it means for a complaint to be substantiated or sustained, kind of just procedurally what that means. Right. Um, a, com a complaint that has been sustained basically means that whatever the allegation was, mm -hmm. that officer did that and we sustain that complaint and there will be a disciplinary action to follow that's comparable to whatever it is that the person did. It could be, you know, just a letter of reprimand. It could be uh, suspension days or hours. It could be up to termination. So, yeah, you're welcome. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Chief. Uh, it's always good to see you. Um, thanks for a great report. I just wanted to ask a question about the use of force investigations and the, the threshold an allegation has to cross before it becomes an actual investigation. I noticed some of them are citizen generated and some of them are DPD generated. And what, what's the protocol for something to, to merit or warrant an, an investigation? So, of course, we have policies and procedures of how officers are supposed to handle certain types of situations. Uh, what amount of force, what amount of, uh, what level of communication is required to help mitigate a situation, whether or not that was appropriate or inappropriate. Officers have several tools around their tool belt. They also start with vo voice commands. You know, what's the most appropriate action for that particular situation? Now, if the department has generated the complaint, that means that it was either reported internally from some other officer or it was um, determined on maybe even body camera footage during an audit that there was some inappropriate action here. So we do um, several internal and sometimes our own internal administrative investigations can be more than what we receive from you know, the general public. That's just part of us following policies and procedures and uh, holding our folks accountable for their actions. Right. Well, I, I was, I was, I was heartened to see. It, it, it seems to me five is like a really low number for for. You know, that, that, I mean, that's, that's very for heartening. Use of force. Yeah, that that's that's very heartening to hear. Is so. All allegations don't necessarily become investigations, though. Correct. If 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 it's, if it's a citizen generated use of force, they come in and say, "Officer so and so did such and such." It absolutely does. So there was oh so the the five investigations actually correlate to just five allegations for use of force. Use of force. Right. There were other. There could have been like um, a courtesy investigation, or I didn't feel that I sh I deserved a ticket. You know, those investigations come in too. But um, for the purpose of this report, I wanted you to know about some of the most you know, um, egregious kinds of incidents that occur between law enforcement and the community. Uh, also, I know that there's a lot of concern and, you know, monitoring of our body camera uh, program and the checks and balances that we put in place to address those types of concerns as well. And the respect of the rights of others as well, like courtesy. How did you talk to that person and uh, what, what was the result of it? So uh, we do those investigations internally when we determine that there was some impropriety or uh, something egregious done or communicated in a way that it shouldn't be. And then, of course, we get complaints from the outside as well, from citizens as well. Mm -hmm. Finally, I want to say, Chief, that tonight I'm not prepared to commit to uh, 20 more officers because our city's growing. You might come back and tell us we need 40. So I want to leave room uh, to, to do more if you tell us so. All right? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Council Member. And just for the record, if I could, uh, I think council members are all aware, but just remind you, we have a second budget retreat this Friday, and actually one of the topics uh, on the agenda for uh, for Friday is uh, some uh, background information on uh, public safety staffing, both in police and fire. We look forward to range planning about that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Council Member Freeman. Uh, just one last thing. I just wanted to be make sure I'm clear, because wrapping my mind around this, if there is an excessive use of force complaint. Does this go through an HR process or is this still a public, like is it public record? Like how does that work? Well, it, it comes through as uh, an internal affairs process. Okay. 
you know, where we conduct the investigation. Uh, of course, we provide information publicly about our um, use of force cases, and we provide that, you know, a quarterly report to make sure that that information is out there in the public so people can see exactly, you know, what, were the, what was the result of various cases. And then we talk to individuals who have filed complaints so that they can uh, know what the result of of their complaint was as well. And you would talk to the individual that filed the complaint? Oh yeah, they received something in writing too, okay. to know the disposition of the complaint. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Chief. Yes, uh, sir. Thank you so much. Um, I have a couple of uh, questions. One is um, uh, the, you, you talked about respecting the rights of others. Could you describe what that means? Um, that could be a situation internally in the department or even externally you know a citizen you pull over a citizen and you didn't your, your tone of voice or refusing to answer a question um, or raising your voice to um, a co-worker um, those are the kind of things courtesy thank you uh, the has anyone to your knowledge used the safe any of the safe place uh, businesses yet? Has anyone made use of those businesses to, to, uh, to find a, a refuge? I can find that information out. Where is Will? Do you know it? If, if, we'll check with our liaison. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I was impressed with the attrition statistics. We're doing better and yes. uh, much better. Also with the, uh, the fact that how fully staffed we are in comparison to past years. And uh, we're much more competitive now um, with our pay and our various bonuses. And uh, I'm, you know, for people living in the, moving to the city and that kind of thing. Uh, Absolutely. And so I'm really pleased with that. Also, uh, uh, Council Member Middleton also already mentioned the use of force complaints. And I, I'm really pleased the extent to which those have dropped. There's a very low number. And um, it's a super important category of statistics. So I know we're all very happy about that and want to appreciate it. Um, the, and, and I just want to, again, highlight, this is a fantastic report. Thank you, you. you, when, you know, every, every bullet wound is a, is, you know, is a terrible, you know, rends our community not just a family, but a neighborhood and a community. So when we get a report like this, which shows the drop in violent crime mm -hmm. that we have had, uh, and one number that's not in here, but uh, <coughs> crimes with a gun, uh, all crimes with a gun are down 20% over the previous year. Violent crime is down 13%. I know we all need to be careful not to just take one year as, as too important, but that those are big numbers. Uh, I, it's very unlikely we can repeat that. But I also want to say what Councilmember Reese said, which is we are at the we are we are at continuing 18 year downward trend in crime. Our property crime is uh, as the lowest it's been in many, many years. And the uh, and the violent crime is down as well. Uh, in addition to which, all the things that we want to be up are up. Our referrals to the misdemeanor diversion court. Uh, the uh, and then the 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 well I guess these are not up but the reduction in in searches and the kinds of trust building activity that we're doing is up at the same time as the crime is being reduced and I'm just really impressed and just want to appreciate that so thank you very much thank you council members any other questions or comments for the chief thank you very much chief it's been a long night up there at that point <laughs> it's all right thank you That's what we do mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, we're now going to move on to item 20. Item 20 is zoning map, map change for Davis Park West. And I'm going to uh, first ask for uh, a report from the staff. Good evening. I'm Emily Struthers with the Planning Department. Uh, I would first like to state for the record that all Planning Department hearing items have been advertised and noticed in accordance with state and local law 
and affidavits of all notices are on file in the planning department. A request for a zoning map change has been received from Patrick Biker of Morningstar Law Group for two parcels located at 362 Davis Drive and 900 Marion Avenue, totaling 10.847 acres. The site is presently zoned Commercial General with a development plan, CGD, which is legacy case Z0727. It allowed a maximum of 6,000 square feet of office, 37,000 square feet of retail, and 180 hotel rooms in the area proposed for rezoning. Mr. Biker proposes to change this designation to mixed use with a development plan, MUD, to allow for a maximum of 245,000 square feet of office, 35,000 square feet of commercial, and a maximum of 482 residential units. The parcel is currently designated as commercial on the future land use map, which is consistent with the proposed zoning change. The Durham Planning Commission at their January 8, 2019 meeting recommended approval of the proposed mixed use for the development plan MUD zoning district by a vote of 13 to zero. Staff determines that the request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. Two motions are required for this application. The first is to adopt a, a consistency statement and the second is for the zoning ordinance. Thank you very much, Ms. Struthers. You all have heard the report of staff. I'm now gonna declare the public hearing open. And uh, we have several people who have signed up to speak on this item. Uh, but first I will ask if there are any questions for Ms. Struthers by members of the council at this point. I have a general question. Council Member Freeman, Ms. Struthers. I'm just, just for updates purposes, because I've been off the planning commission for a little bit. Uh, who exactly uh, does the approval for the elementary or for schools, for DPS schools? Is it the board or is it actual staff that makes an approval based on what's presented to them? I'm sorry, for the schools? Yeah, so where, where there are apartments added, there's residents added, there's a number that's developed, like a number of formula that's used. And then does DPS get this information at all? Do they receive this? And yeah, Good evening, Pat Young with the Planning Department. Uh, that information, uh, Council Member Freeman, is received from the school board. So DPS provides that to us uh, quarterly, and they update it quarterly. So we, we receive that from their um, enrollment um, administration team. And uh, we apply those based on um, previous council, board of commissioner, and DPS policy on a system-wide basis. So it's received, I'm sorry. I'm we receive the information from DPS. We do not give back. We don't share any information about planned properties that are coming up online or anything. We, we definitely do. We do share that information back. Um, and the estimated uh, student generation rates um, were done based on consultation with DPS um, by the planning department uh, and in consultation with DPS based on their actual enrollment and, and managed to be reflect the enrollment that they've seen. And is, is that specifically with like DPS at the superintendent's level or is there conversation with the principals as well? It's, it's through the superintendent's office. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, council member. Thank you, Mr. Young. Any other questions or, or comments for um, staff at this time? If not, I'm going to ask that speakers, uh, there, there are three speakers signed up to speak on this item. Uh, two proponents, Mr. Patrick Biker and Ms. Heather Schaefer, and one opponent, uh, Ms. Cynthia, I'm not sure if it says white or woot, I'm not sure, and I apologize. Um, the, um, so uh, well, I'm going to, uh, at this point, uh, give both the proponents and the opponents uh, 10 minutes to speak, uh, and we'll see how that goes, if, if, any, if any more is needed than that. So, uh, Mr. Biker, you are sharing your time with Ms. Heather Schaefer. Thank you, Ma Mayor Shul. Good evening, Mayor. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson, members of the City Council, I'm Patrick Biker with Morningstar Law Group. I live at 2614 Stewart Drive. Along with Craig Davis, the CEO of Craig Davis Properties, our traffic engineer Earl Llewellyn, and our landscape architect Richard Brown of Kimley Horn, and our lead architect Michael Stevenson with Perkins and Will, 
I'm here tonight representing Craig Davis Properties for this agenda item. It's been my privilege to work with Craig Davis Properties on this development for the past 15 years. Back around 2003 and 2004, we referred to this section of Durham as Triangle Metro Center, and it was approved and began developing in accordance with the Durham 2020 Comprehensive Plan. The 2020 plan was our community's first document to call for compact neighborhoods, and Triangle Metro Center was a groundbreaking development, literally and figuratively, 15 years ago. As Triangle Metro Center was moving forward, the original version of our comprehensive plan was adopted in February of 2005. In that initial version of our comp plan, Triangle Metro Center was specifically designated as a compact neighborhood on the development tier map. Then, over the past decade or so, in the wake of the Great Recession, and the demise of the Triangle Transit Authority's regional fixed guideway plan, we renamed this 150-acre area as Davis Park. Pursuant to what we designed and what was approved 15 years ago, Davis Park has been built out primarily as a surface park development. Now, while we think the Finsbury townhouses and condominiums, along with the other apartments that were developed in accordance with the original entitlements, all that represents a great neighborhood for Durham. But now, we strongly believe that this is the time for Davis Park to become more vertical, to incorporate structured parking, and quite frankly, to provide the shot in the arm that the RTP section of Durham has needed for the past 15 years. In short, Davis Park can provide the pedestrian-oriented, mixed-use environment to generate the type of momentum we need in order to create an alternative, vibrant location for businesses and residents outside of downtown. To that end, we are proposing this mixed-use development which brings the intensity to support structured parking and vertically integrated commercial uses. We've put together a tremendous local team to create this vertically integrated mixed use development, spearheaded by Craig Davis and Michael Stevenson with Perkins and Will here in downtown Durham. In closing, uh, we do wanna thank our neighbors in Finsbury who have given us their valuable input, input during this process. We respectfully request your approval of this ambitious project to transform 10 vacant acres into the game changer this part of Durham needs. We have a friend from Finsbury here tonight, and after she shares her thoughts, I'll be happy to answer any questions, and I do wish to retain two minutes of time for rebuttal. Thank you, Mayor. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Biker. Council. Um, Ms. Heather Schaefer. Hi, my name is Heather Schaefer. I live at 120 Finsbury Street. I'm in the Davis Park development, and I was here just to tell you that um, as a Resident, I'm here as a proponent of this development. I um, bought into the development um, when it was still a field in 2005. Um, I finally moved in in 2007, and I bought into the idea that I was gonna have a, um, a, a dense urban feel in the Durham area. Um, and of course, we all know what happened in 2008 with the recession, and I've been so excited that some of the original vision is coming to life. Um, with Craig Davis and his team. And so I just wanted to let you know how much um, we as residents are excited about this. Um, we're the ones who are walking our dogs. We're the ones who are looking for somewhere where we can walk our dogs, sit and have a cup of coffee and enjoy the area. So just wanna let you know how excited we are about this. And um, of course, I'm happy to help in any way I can to get this going so we can have a vibrant community. Thank you very much, Ms. Schaefer. Um, uh, Mr. Biker and Ms. Schaefer, the proponents have six minutes remaining, uh, should you need them. Uh, and now I'll ask uh, for... Just want to retain two minutes, two minutes for rebuttal, Mayor. All right. My suggestion is you hold on to the whole six, but it's up to you. Ms. Cynthia Woot. I'm sorry, Ms. White. I apologize. Couldn't read your writing. Could you give us your name and address, please? Yes, my name is Cynthia White, and I represent um, 800 Finsbury Street, which is adjacent to the rezoning in question. Um, and the reason I'm here tonight is I'm representing the owner of that adjacent property, which is um, Republic Flats Apartments. And we are asking for a 30-day continuance from the City Council. Um, the reason for this request is that the adjacent property only, owner only recently became aware of the rezoning after receiving notice of the public hearing. Um, Eaton Vance purchased the property in October after the neighborhood meeting. Um, Petitioner Davis Park West knew that the adjacent property had changed owners during the course of the rezoning process and that the new owner was likely not aware of the pending rezoning. 
Um, although petitioner has corresponded with the new owner, its desire to redevelop the property, petitioner never mentions the ongoing rezoning process. Um, that petitioner's property is subject to private deed restrictions that prevent the property from being used for mixed use or even rezoned without consent from the adjacent owner. Um, so we ask that the continuance would give the adjacent owner an opportunity to study the plans and determine whether it can consent to the proposed project. Um, the approval of the rezoning will not alter the private restric restrictions and may leave the adjacent owner with no option but to litigate its rights, causing a much longer delay in construction of the project. Thank you. Um, would you do me a favor? Mm -hmm. Would you repeat your main points again? Yes. For me? Thank so you. basically, we're asking for a 30-day continuance to basically look at the owner would like to look at the plans. Um, they're saying that it's a restricted um, title and that it's only supposed to be for commercial and not mixed use. So they weren't, they want to ask for that continuance because they were not aware the property just sold. The new owners were not made aware of this rezoning process until after the sale. So thank you. So let me make sure I'm clear. They would like the council to continue the public hearing for 30 days. Yes. And so that they can contest the, what the, um, that there was a, a deed restriction? Yes. And the claim is that the deed restriction is that this land can only be, can I, what is the deed restriction allegedly? So there's, it's a private deed restriction that prevents the property from being used for mixed use. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Ms. White. Um, you also have significant time left, as you can see. Oh, that's it. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, Mr. Biker, I'm going to ask you to come and respond to that. Certainly. I, again, I'm Patrick Biker representing Craig Davis Properties. Uh, I, I hope the council had a m minute today to look at the uh, email that I sent, and I certainly uh, don't mean to, uh, don't know where the previous speaker received her information, but I'd like to share with each member of the city council an email sent by uh, Craig Davis's team to Eaton Vance, a real estate fund in Boston that the previous speaker referred to. You can see that it's dated October 1, 2018, and it sent the complete rezoning package, the neighborhood meeting notice and recap, the traffic impact analysis, and two program options prepared by Michael Stevenson and his team at Perkins and Will. Mm -hmm. Also want to share with you further, the second page alludes to, uh, again, this was going in my view, well above and beyond the call of duty because Craig Davis and members of his team actually flew up to Boston to meet with Eaton Vance in October of 2018. I believe, believe it was towards the end of the month. I would have thought they'd be in a good mood after the World Series, but uh, apparently that uh, was not translated to the uh, previous speaker. So I'd like to share this with the council so they see hard copies of the information that was sent to these uh, folks less than three weeks after they acquired the property. And then, of course, there was the in-person visit that happened. That Mr. Biker, if you could uh, hand those to the clerk. and I certainly will. Them. Thank you so much. Um, can I just ask a clarifying question? You said you sent it, I'm assuming, by mail. No, it, was by, it was sent electronically, okay. followed up a few weeks later by an in-person visit. Thank you. It flew all the way from North Carolina to Boston to meet with us. Mr. Biker, why don't you give those to the clerk, and then we may have other questions for you as well. Um, Ms. White, could I ask you a question? Thank you for being here. Ms. White, explain to me, are you a resident of the community? I'm the community manager. You're the community manager. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so this is the owner of the apartment complex yes. that you work for. Okay. Yes. Thank you. I wasn't clear on that. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, council members, uh, any, any questions or comments at this point? I guess I should first ask, is there anyone else who is here tonight who wishes to be heard on this item? Anyone else that wishes to be heard? Council members, Council Member Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Biker, can I ask you a quick question? If I understand the gist of the uh, opponent's uh, argument here, mm -hmm. it's that a 30-day delay would allow them to review the plan and hopefully see if they could consent to the, to the plan, and that otherwise, I believe the speaker mentioned that it would cause some kind of undue litigation delay. Does that mm -hmm. sound about right, ma'am? Did I get that? Awesome. Um, Mr. Biker, if that were true, wouldn't you also be arguing for a 30-day delay? 
That is correct. We are, um, we were in very detailed communications with the previous owner, the party that owned this, these apartments. At the time we held the neighborhood meeting, sent out the initial notices, uh, voluminous emails and teleconferences with the previous owner that were then followed up with the information that I provided to the clerk with the current owner. Um, uh, suffice it to say, we have reviewed the uh, chain of title and we are, um, I lose sleep over a lot of things, but not this one. Um, we're confident that the plan that, that uh, Craig Davis, Michael Stevenson, our team will put forward at the site plan phase will comply with the um, uh, deed restrictions that were referred to in the chain of title. Thank you for that question. Um, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, and after that I'm going to let our, ask our, our interim city attorney to make some comments as well. Thank you. Um, yeah, this is probably more of a question for our staff or for our city attorney, which is um, even assuming that there was a deed restriction in place that would prevent development, I don't think that that um, impacts our decision on whether to do this rezoning, that that's a matter for private litigation down the road and that the rezoning is not directly related to that question. And you're probably the right person to answer that, Madam City Attorney. Why don't we start? It looks like Mr. Young is there. Why don't we Our let him director. start? And then That'd be great. City Attorney will. Thank you. I, we, we did consult the Attorney's Office and I'll, of course I'll let the Interim City Attorney speak, but um, I, I did want to first say it's never the case that we as the City um, or City County Planning Department enforce private um, restrictive covenants, and so that would be the case here, unless they are associated with a development plan commitment, which is not the case here. I'll Thank you. The, Madam attorney. attorney. For any. Um, Mr. Mayor, I think that Mayor Pro Tem Johnson and, and Mr. Young have expressed it exactly as we understand it in our office. I did speak with Don O'Toole, who is general counsel for the planning department, and I know that he and Mr. Biker had had some conversations earlier today. Basically, our question was, has there been an injunction or some sort of injunctive relief sought? My understanding was by the close of business that that was not in place. Um, restrictive covenants are a matter of private property ownership. Um, and if there's an issue with the way that um, the restrictive covenant is being used on the property, then the adjacent property owner really needs to take that up privately through the court system, through private negotiations. That should not hold up the city's process which is a completely separate issue. Thank you, Madam Attorney. Thank you, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Young. <laughs> Council Member Freeman. I just had a couple questions for um, both, yeah. So do you have a estimated price range on these apartments that would be? At this point in time, I'm, I'm sorry, we do not. Um, the only thing I can say is that, um, as I referenced in my comments, this will be a 100% structured, parked environment. Uh, in fact, uh, on the segment of the development that's south of Marion Avenue, um, some of the parking will be underground. If you think structured parking was expensive, wait till you see underground parking. Um, so it, it'll it'll be a um, uh, an expensive product, to, expensive neighborhood to build. Uh, but it is um, important for us to provide the type of housing that uh, will, I think. Um, be attractive to uh, employees in Research Triangle Park as the companies in Research Triangle Park expand in the future. Okay. Great question. Oh, no, I was just going to ask Ms. Ms. White the same the same question. What's your current uh, price range in the community that you have? Like our average rents, um, we offer one, two, and three bedrooms. Our average rents range around thirteen hundred a month. Thank you, Ms. White. Thank you, Council Member. Any other questions uh, or comments by the Council? Is there anyone else that would like to be heard on this item? Any other questions or comments by members of the Council? I have two questions for you, Mr. Biker. Uh, one question is that you're adding, uh, I believe uh, the developers adding 102 students to Durham Public Schools. Mm -hmm. And um, as you know, uh, it's often customary for uh, developers to proper uh, $500 per student uh, to the Durham Public Schools, and I was wondering if you would, the developer had considered such a voluntary proffer. Yes, uh, if I may address both, if you don't mind, Mayor, I'd like to address both this and affordable housing together. Since mm -hmm. Thank you. They are to a certain extent related. You knew I was going to ask that question. I, I, it was, uh, yes, and we appreciate that very much. Um, this is, um, I, I have anecdotal um, stories of 
again, having worked on this pro project for 15 years, I had hair, I had hair when it started. Um, it was, um, it's the type of neighborhood where once people uh, have children, they tend to move out. And so I don't think it'll be a tremendously large generator of school children. So having said that, what uh, our team would like to do is uh, proffer $25,000 to the DPS Foundation to support them in their work. And we'd wordsmith that with the planning director in the morning. Uh, but uh, to pick up on Councilmember Freeman's point, in recognition of the affordable housing uh, challenges that, that we face as a community and the way this project is built, we would like to proffer $75,000 to the uh, Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Uh, again, Woodward Smith, the timing on that with the uh, plan director in the in the uh, morning. So it would be $100,000. In our view, it would be appropriate to be twenty five dollars to the schools since it's, again, it, it's not the type of environment that uh, young couples typically want to raise children in. Uh, but we do recognize the affordable housing, uh, the seriousness and gravity of that situation. And we'd like to contribute $75,000 to the Housing Trust Fund. Thank you, Mr. Biker. Thank you, Mayor Shul. Um, appreciate that. All right, uh, council members, uh, any other questions or comments at this time? Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to follow up on that last point just sure, briefly. Uh, and I, I'm not going to ask Mr. Barker, I'd actually like to ask like you, Mr. Mayor. Sure. Uh, you've been doing this longer than any of the rest of us uh, who were elected to the council. I'm not trying to rub it in, just saying that's okay. the way it goes. <laughs> Do you recall a previous proffer related to schools um, that didn't go to DPS itself? I don't recall. No. Um, Mr. Parker, can you come back up for a moment? If, if you, why if why, you why did you, I, uh, the last, not, we're not there yet. Mm -hmm. So why did you suggest uh, the DPS Foundation? Uh, the last one project I worked on last year, uh, we worked on, we made the contribution voluntarily to the DPS Foundation. And so I got to meet uh, a former Principal as Deputy Superintendent Key through that, and I uh, was very impressed with the organization, and that's why we put forward the suggestion. If it's the council's preference for it to go to DPS, we're happy to do it. Well, the challenge is what they face. I think you should let them. It, it, whatever is the pleasure of the council, we're happy to we're happy to oblige. Do you want to make a suggestion on that, Mr. Mason? Please. Um, I think it's probably better that I don't make a suggestion, Mr. Mayor. I'll leave that to my colleagues to suggest other Thank options. You. I guess I, I try to be careful on these proffers. I would like to I would like to say though, it is interesting the challenges that they're facing um, right now with DPS and the overflow of children in some schools and not in others, and also recognizing um, there are a couple of schools that need to be built, and I don't know that that the Durham Public Schools Foundation is, is going to focus on that area, but I do know that DPS would. I just want to make sure I offer that. It's the council's pleasure. If, if it would be more effective to... Mr. Mr. Biker, mm -hmm. I am absolutely positive that it's your pleasure. Mm -hmm. All right. This is a voluntary okay. proffer. It's up to you. We have no... We should not be negotiating this. It's your call. Okay. I appreciate right. the questions by Mr. Reese. Good question, and by, both by Council Member Freeman. Both excellent. Uh, I, I, I can sense that it would be more appropriate for the $25,000 to be uh, donated directly during public schools. I'd be happy to do that. Thank you, Mr. Biker. Thank you so much. Council Members, thank you for your good comments and questions. And now I'm going to uh, ask if there's anyone else who'd like to comment on this item. If not, I'm going to de declare this hearing closed. The matter's back before the Council. Uh, one, uh, we, uh, I'll invite a motion to adopt a consistency statement. So moved. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we adopt a consistency statement. Madam Clerk, would you please open the vote? Please close the vote. The motion passes 7-0. Thank you. Second motion would be to adopt the ordinance amending the UDO. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we, ad that we adopt the ordinance amending the UDO. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. Motion passes 7-0. Thank you, Madam, Madam Clerk. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. Ms. White, thank you for being here as well. Uh, Mr. Davis, thank you all for being here. We'll now move on to item 21, zoning map change, Hale Street duplex, and uh, we'll now hear the report from staff. 
Good evening again. Uh, Emily Struthers with the Planning Department. A request for a zoning map change has been received from Martin McFarling for two parcels located at 1020 Howe Street, totaling 0 0.345 acres. This site is located in the Old West Durham Neighborhood Protection Overlay. The site is presently zoned Residential Urban 5, RU5. Mr. McFarling proposes to change this designation to Residential Urban 5-2, RU5-2, to allow duplexes. There is no development plan associated with this case. The parcel is currently designated as medium density residential on the future land use map, which is consistent with the proposed zoning change. The Durham Planning Commission at their January 3, 2019 meeting recommended approval of the proposed residential urban 5-2 RU-5-2 zoning district by a vote of nine to four. Staff determines that the request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. Two motions are required for this application. The first is to adopt a consistency statement and the second is for the zoning ordinance. Thank you, Ms. Struthers. Council members, are there any questions or comments at this point for, I'm sorry, thank you, Ms. Struthers. You have heard the report from staff. I will now declare the public hearing open. Council members, are there any comments or questions at this point for uh, staff? No. Hearing none, then I'm going to uh, move to the speakers. We have uh, two speakers signed up on this item. Um, one proponent and one opponent. Uh, one proponent, Mr. Marty McFarling. One opponent, Mr. William Whitmore. Um, th is there anyone else who would like to be heard on this item? Anyone else that would like to be heard on this item? If not, I'm going to first ask to hear from the proponents. Uh, Mr. McFarling, you have five minutes. <clears throat> Council members, Mayor Swill, uh, good evening. My name is Marty McFarling. I actually live at uh, 5014 Renville Drive in Greensboro, North Carolina. Uh, I had sent an email out um, a couple of days ago. Hopefully all the council members had a chance to read it. It kind of gave you a little bit of biography about myself and kind of what I'm trying to accomplish here. Uh, I did grow up in Durham, born right over here in Watts Hospital, all that wonderful stuff, Holt, Juney, Northern High School for schools, before I had to move up to Greensboro in the early 90s for employment opportunities. I'm sorry, she said, I, yeah, can I? Yeah. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you, Vivian. Right. Um, let me get back to where I was. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, I've owned these properties for over 30 years. It's been a long road trying to get to this point. I originally tried to maybe get this ball rolling back in 2001, 2000. Of course, we all know what happened to the economy then. Uh, so I had to wait a little bit. Well, I thought I'd try again in 2008, 2009. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Timing wasn't right then either. So basically, I've come before you now with a simple request for a duplex housing unit, uh, a new one that I can build on an empty lot. I have an existing uh, non-conforming duplex unit on the other lot that I would like to get conforming. I have no hidden agenda here, and I didn't pay $1,795.40 for an application fee to take this lightly. Um, I, I know what I need, and I know how I need to do it. Um, and there's a few special reasons why. Uh, I outlined a few of those in the email. Again, the non-conforming versus conforming use of the existing duplex, uh, I believe on lot 139. And then uh, the new duplex that I would like to put on lot 141, uh, hopefully with the idea of having my father and a live-in caregiver on one side and the other side be used for income. I also look at this as a structure that I can age into later on in my life. I, I would like to move back to Durham at some point. Greensboro is nice, but I'm a Durham boy. Um, and then really one of the biggest reasons that the duplex zoning is what I'm asking for is that um, I'm having to finance this. I'm not a rich person, so of course I gotta go talk to a bank. And I can tell you right now, the uh, banks do not wanna finance non-conforming construction on property. So. 
That's why in talking to a bank, I need to have a duplex zoning so that they can see, yeah, there's no chance that you know, you're doing something illegal or something against the city ordinance. Um, so we get to that point, 221. All right, uh, let me address a couple of the concerns that the um, Planning Commission brought up. Uh, you have those in your comments, but uh, a couple of the biggest ones were related to, well, hey, he can build a single family house on there and then put an ADU on it. Again, we get back to the financing problem with this. The bank looks at, two, at, at a duplex in a certain way and a single family house with an ADU in a certain way as far as financing these things. Um, a single family house trying to finance it as investment housing is a lot more difficult because they will not recognize the income off the ADU. They just consider that an extra place. If you happen to get an extra rent check or two out of it, great, but we're gonna consider it unoccupied. The duplex is a different story. Uh, they'll go ahead and project a 25% occupied uh, uh, vacancy rate in each side, but with two units uh, sitting there with the possibility of producing income, then that looks more favorably to the bank as they try to underwrite the mortgage on this thing. Uh, and then the thing I like to do as a financial planner is to mitigate my risk as much as possible. And by mitigating my risk uh, and having a duplex, I have two separately metered water meter and everything. It's actually going to cost me more money in water meters and power meters than a single family house would but it gives me the ability to sell off a side if I need to. And you see that in the mountains and you see that at the beach. Two owners, one duplex. So it does give me more flexibility. And as I found out more about the equal housing choice opportunities that y'all are now looking at, that kind of got me excited, especially when I saw something about maybe an ADU being allowed behind a duplex, but I understand that's been knocked off the board now anyway. So a um, couple other things before I run out of time here. Um, Really, the main thing is that I really want to try to do something nice in the neighborhood. I got 18 seconds. There's a couple of pictures on that zip drive. The reason I didn't come with a development plan is because things are still a little bit in flux in that neighborhood. And instead of wasting money on plans now that the Equal Housing Choice Initiative is coming into play, um, you know, I want to get the rezoning done first, and then I can go to the development plan and work with something concrete. Thank you, Mr. McFarland. I'm sorry about the pictures. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thumb drive. Mr. Whitmore. I'm going to ask him. Can you please give us your name and address? And you also have five minutes. Well, I'm William Whitmore. I live behind the property at 2101 Inglewood Avenue. And I guess before I talk, I. Thank you guys for waiting here. I also want to say I much more enjoyed your meeting last time I was here. That was 21 minutes long. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for staying. Um, I guess what I want to say, I have no objection to dividing that property, and I'm glad you guys are working on infill for this, you know, to, to uh, increase our density. What I would like to see, I, I guess what I'm concerned about is, is um, how much owner occupancy there is in, in the neighborhood, because I think that's part of the strength of our neighborhood. I love our neighborhood. We have, you know, opportunities for people to rent. We have duplexes. We have owner, you know, people that own their own houses. We have a whole different range of housing options in there, and that's a good thing. And, um, you know, he's going to, the when you split it up, there's a, you need to fix that, the non-conforming thing with the, when he splits his land. I just would like to see built there what it was originally zoned for, which is a, a single family dwelling and now with the, the ability to get the ADUs that that will go ahead and, and um, be another step towards your, your, your goal of uh, increasing the amount of, of ownership there. I guess one of the things I guess I'm, I'm sort of worried about is, is that if you don't have enough people, you know, living in the, in the, sp in the spot, you know, if they're owned by people in the distance, they make decisions about the, the property on uh, different criteria. So, for instance, we're going to be worrying about our canopy a little bit, and it's, if you're living there, you know, you're much more likely, I think, in my opinion, to plant a tree that's going to be big and stay there for years. If you're, if you're owning the, the property as, as rental property, then that tree becomes a little bit more of a liability because you have to worry about 
you know, cleaning up after it and, and getting the leaves off the roof and all sorts of things like that. So um, and part of the reason I wanted to speak down here now is because I know and pretty soon you're going to have a big, long train of people talking about this new, the, the new housing proposal. And I, this way I get your attention all to myself. So um, as, you, as you're working on that proposal, if, if you would direct a little bit of thought towards um, maintaining kind of our ratio of rentals to non-rental property and encouraging, you know, a, a good good mix of owner ownership in there because I think that really makes a big difference in keeping the continuity of the, the neighborhood and, and uh, keeping it strong where you have some people, you know, enough people that have a lot of skin in the game, as they say, for, for staying long periods of time and, and taking care of the property and looking at it a different way than if it's rentals. So, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Whitmore. All right. You guys, were there any questions or? We'll find out. Okay. <laughs> Council members, you have heard uh, the speakers. Let me ask, is there anyone else here in, in, the, uh, in the room tonight who would like to be heard on this item before I go back to council members for any questions or comments? Council members, any questions or comments for either of the speakers or for the staff? Any questions or comments? I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to ask a couple of questions of the sure. opponent. Sure, do you mind coming back? First of all, I appreciate you sticking around with us. Um, <laughs> this is our job to sit up here <laughs> as long as the meeting lasts, but you didn't, you okay, didn't have to I do that, so I appreciate taste it. I this a little bit, and so I can do it every now and again. I know the feeling. Um, you own, you live directly behind this property, is that correct? Right. But directly behind, or just like well, any corner from it, or? It's a little, my lot actually has an extra lot that's behind it. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. I'm just a little confused. You... I mean, at this point, as far as, there's, there are actually a lot of duplexes right in that area, and I'm sort of thinking that we're getting into overload a little bit if we build another one. There's that one. There's one he has. There's one across the street on Hale. There's, you know, um, there's another one directly right next to me, and then another one that has, after that, there's one that has a, a house and an ADU on it, but actually it's functioning as a duplex. They're, they're both rentals. I'm a little confused. You seem to be, although you never said it out loud, you seem to be suggesting that a duplex is more likely to be a rental property than a single family home and an ADU. Yeah, that's just been my experience, yes. Okay, just based on what you've seen. Yeah, well, I, I guess I, I, I mean, we don't have a lot of single family homes and ADUs at this point, so I, I, I guess I think that there, if you have a single family home and an ADU, it's more likely at least to flip back and forth between being a double rental and and a, somebody who owns it and wants to rent out, rent it off and use it as a a source of income, or else you know have a relative that's staying there. I guess the reason I was a little confused is that you, although never stated, the subtext here seems to be that Mr. McFarling is going to build this duplex to rent to people. If that yeah. if the concern is mm -hmm. renting, yeah, and I, I guess I feel like you know the other option that's it's actually zoned for right now and is still fits his, what he needs, which is he would like to have a place where there's a, you know, a caretaker and, a, and, his, and his father. And, and it also and meets the, it can suffer the same, according to you, bad fate um, that well, the duplexes Well, I'm not, I'm not calling, to. I don't want to say that this is a bad fate, but I, I think it's much more likely, you know, if, if the arrangement is a, a, a full house and an RD, and I always want to call these RDUs, yeah. it's really been hard for me, ADU, um, that it's much more likely that at some point someone will, you know, a family will move in there and want to rent it out or someone, that, and, and or it'll be easy for it to transition into that. You wouldn't have to scrape away the duplex and then, you know, build this other, we, we have a lot of big houses in there. That are build, being built on these properties. I appreciate you letting me ask these questions and kind of think about. I, I mean, I guess about. the other thing I also worry about is you know we have in our neighborhood we have somebody who I think actually has like a hundred properties, you know, and that I worry that if you have too many duplexes that you you start having you know sort of a lot of large ownerships and amputees landlords and that. 
you know, th these are taken care of well of now, but um, if later on something happens to the company that has all of these things and, you know, they end up in some sort of courts for a long period of time, then you have a, a, large, a large section of the neighborhood that gets impacted by that, where, the, you know, the properties are not kept as well for a long period of time. And whereas if you spread that out over a lot of people, you know, in, in smaller bunches where you have not hard, large holdings, and, uh, then you don't have that problem. And I, I guess I just think that the, you know, I'm sort of talking to a little bit to what you guys are, are thinking about now is, is that the, uh, the model of having the, the uh, accessory dwellings is, is more likely to not end up in that kind of situation that, as, as a duplex would. Appreciate that. Thank you, sir. I, mean, I, I, I'm, I don't know if I'm being clear about this or not, but I appreciate your time. Thanks. Thank you. Any question? Any other questions or comments? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Councilmember Freeman. Uh, the planning staff. I just want to make sure that that I understand because this this is inside a neighborhood protection overlay. This is measured against a certain a different criteria, and this is what you're, you're saying it fits for the neighborhood protection overlay. Yes, the uh, proposed zoning uh, request is consistent with the um, zoning as well as the neighborhood protection overlay zoning. Thank you. Other questions or comments by members of the council? Is there anyone else that would like to be heard on this matter? Anyone here tonight who would like to be heard on this matter? All right. Um, I'm going to declare this public hearing closed and the matter is back before the council and uh, I'll just make a comment that um, I appreciate hearing from Mr. Whitmore who happens to be my best friend but I am going to vote against him tonight. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, all right. So we'll now take and I, and I used to live in, in that house and I... You do. <laughs> Really? Back up? Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Whitmore. No, we you've had your five minutes. <laughs> the world. You guys are pandering away on his birthday weekend, so I, I was going to put in a plea for you to, to be kind to him, but I think I changed my mind. And I'm sure <laughs> you guys would spoil it for him. It would be good. Thank you, Mr. Whitmore. That would be enough of that. All right. Uh, we'll now, uh, the matter is now back before the council, and uh, we'll, I'll entertain a motion to adopt the consistency statement. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. We adopt the consistency statement. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Please close the vote. Motion passes six to one with council member Freeman voting no. Thank you very much. Uh, motion two to adopt the ordinance amending the UDO. So moved. Second. It's been moved and second that we adopt the ordinance to by amending the UDO. I'm sorry, to adopt the ordinance amending the UDO. Madam Clerk, open the vote, please. Thank you. Please close the vote. Motion passes six to one with Councilmember Freeman voting no. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you all for being here. Um, there being no more business to come before this body. I'm going to declare this meeting adjourned, 942.